another Sunday, a Sunday look back, and this time at a topic that has been brought up to me many, many, many times, and it is the topic of blast rights, and that's what we're going to get into today, oh boy. Uh, yeah, where do you start? I mean, leaving off with um, the Two Dark Park chat, um, it was crazy that somehow accidentally that chat went uh, public. Uh, I don't know how, it was a, just ended up being un, or listed instead of unlisted. And that chat has um, attained some 20,000 plus views since. So it's kind of crazy. Um, this one is uh, exclusive for Patreon, I hope, I think. It's not that I hope, it's just that you guys support and this is essentially for years. So I try to do the best job kind of like telling this telling my my story of my memories of this album and the experience of going through it. And uh, I shall say that the Two Dark Park tour um, kind of framed up um, essentially what would become the basis of the recording of Last Rites as how we would roll into it. I remember that, um, you know, when we when we started Two Dark Park, both Dwayne and I had essentially thought that um, is Skinny Puppy even going to continue? We we were kind of like faced with this. Um, I mean, there was a big diversion when Al came along and then Ogre got involved with ministry. And not to say that was a bad thing. It was it was actually kind of pure to have people, you know, join forces here and there and do things. We, we were already doing it ourselves. And so but it became a time where I think it was like, felt like an all or nothing th thing. And I don't know the details about um, what happened with Ogre and Ministry, but somehow, obviously, we ended up back in the studio, made Two Dark Park, and then went out and did a tour that was, you know, by production senses, it was um, grandiose. So we undertook the idea instead of, uh, as our previous tour, two guys uh, with keyboards, as, as we typically presented ourselves, and then it, it kind of grew, um, you know, through Ain't It Dead Yet with live stand up drums and so on like this. But now, uh, especially into Last Rites, um, the integration of live instruments um, was becoming ever more so prevalent. So, um, Dramasaurus definitely um, would begin to take, um, for me, anyways, as far as the compositional side. Um, um, heavier aspect as far as like um, the, produ the production of Last Rites and, 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 and how it has its unique sounds. Um, I think for me, as we roll in, in into the idea of making an album, this one was also um, set up in a time where we were going to write the album pretty much most of it live in the studio, which we hadn't really ever done before. We typically always had a song or an ideas or whatever. And in this case, there was a few ideas that were kicking around and I'll go into that in detail, like which ones those are uh, beforehand. But most of them, hi, Tiger Lily. Most of them were um, basically um, written in Mushroom Studios in Vancouver, Canada. And, um, you know, what a, what a great place to actually end up writing. I actually found the budget for the recording and um, it showed that we paid $40 an hour and we we took 200 hours. So this roughly, I believe that the, the rates of a studio would be far greater these days. And uh, we also had a budget of, I think like $7,000 for mixing, which was something like, um, Little Mountain Studios, I believe, was close to $1,000 a day for mixing. So we had to kind of like idealize how we were going to do it. And so 200 hours, um, I believe it looked like it was like a period of three weeks or something like that. And the first thing that I remember is rolling in there and going into the front lounge in Mushroom and basically setting up my sampler that I had, which was the um the emacs 2 that i had just recently acquired which is like deemed you know high technology 
uh, for, I think it's a compressed 12 bit sampler, but you know, it has a sound as Curtis filters and it's utilized as, I still have it. Um, we still have the original, um, we, I say, I still have the original uh, uh, Emacs and Emacs 2. And uh, that was basically, um, when I think about last rites, I think about how prevalent um, certain instruments are as far as like their presence on the album is concerned. Uh, there's no doubt that the Emacs 2, as seen here in this um, dynamic photograph, um, was like um, a huge part of it. So as I've shown earlier, what, what, what I would do and became common practice is to take a set of keys, say from here to here, have one sample go here and build, build a bank across the entire bed of the, of the keyboard. And a better part of, as you saw earlier in Two Dark Park was, um, this was constructed very similarly in the sense that I would set out with the Emacs and just start sampling and come up with a variety of, of things and see where it leads. And that led me right into uh, the first song uh, in the album, which is uh, Love and Vain. Uh, the working title uh, was Hinder. And basically it was a song I started running in the front lounge, even so much as to wind the record player up was there was a wind up record player uh, in the front uh, lounge in Mushroom Studios. And I told Ken Marshall to wind up record player. And he says, wind the record player up. And there was, I believe, 78s in there, which I sampled a lot of. And um, basically um, would sort of like set up the framework for, um, for what would become the groove. The groove uh, at this time was always based around our S900. And, you know, by this time, here's some of the gear we, we're utilizing. This is the Drumosaurus uh, from Last Rites. You'll see that the Emacs 2 is to my left there. So any song that I had, and then I, this is on the tour, by the way. So I would utilize still sounds from the actual songs uh, that I could play live or trigger live. But uh, essentially, it was a key essential component to a large part of what Last Rites was for me and for Dwayne. Uh, by the way, yeah, those, those are the radios there as being triggered by those four Simmons pads you see there. Uh, each one of these uh, car stereos was loaded either on a radio station or a, uh, it was like a British metal cassette, like some sort of weird uh, with the classical tapes, um, usually weird, obscure, like metal tapes, um, British metal, always sounded good, um, triggering it. And so, uh, yeah, this, 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 this is known as the Drumosaurus, and basically um, it, it's what you're hearing in um, on the album as far as a combination of this and the lovely uh, S900 and the radios. Oh, and that lovely, believe it or not, by this time you would think that we, we would have had a, a different computer. No, that's not going to be the case at all. The, the album was sequenced by the lovely Atari 1040ST. Uh, with the program, the Steinberg Pro 24. And believe it or not, it was with us for from Vivisect all the way through uh, to the end of the process. I did not stop composing using this method uh, till the end of what you might call official skinny puppy with Dwayne. And that's, that's just how it went. Um, some of the delays we had also continued on and were always, always used, like it was like our mainstay effects a couple of Ibanez delays, um, the Lexicon PCM41, of course, you know, these were staples, like all of our drum samples are basically done on the S900, pretty much, except as time went on, um, samples were made on the Emacs, both Emacs's, and uh, also affected by uh, distortion pedals. Um, uh, we use vocoders, and uh, of course, my first synth I ever bought, the Moog, uh, multi mood the two oscillator synth that's just has a, a hell of a lot of noise potential so a lot of stuff from that you know there is not a lot of pro one on um on last rights there is on uh, inquisition uh but i can try to tell you that i do not believe there is much more um this was our first sampler as i've talked about previously 
on this album, it was used, utilized for more so uh, just effects. The Mirage was still around. We we're still using, utilizing two Mirages. We had quite, we have a quite large library of amazing samples. All, most of them on the on Mirage taken by Duane. Um, I just found the Mirage to be such a clunker. It was like, soon as it was like, uh, get into the uh, Emacs, uh, whether it be the Emacs one as seen here, this was our first one that we did most of Vivisect and, uh, and Rabies. And then, uh, as I said, we, we got the Emacs two and kind of graduated. And um, the ESQ is also heavily flavored throughout the album as this is like the first FM synth that you'll find in most of the Skinny Peppy stuff, more heavily featured in, uh, in Two Dark Park and songs like Grave Wisdom and such. But I'm absolutely certain that um, that the uh, the appearance of a couple of new synths happened uh, on, on on last rights, and that is the prominence of the SY seventy seven, which was became you know a huge component of a, like like Dwayne's arsenal, um, as well. Um, yeah, the SY-77, I had to say that, you know, as soon as Dwayne incorporated, uh, I don't have a picture of that, folks, sorry, but I did, but I don't, but so you can look at a picture of that online, but, uh, you know, it's it's a Yamaha FM synth, and I remember that Dwayne used to love to take what he considered to be the most radical presets within it, and sort of like start with those as a, as a starting point, and then take them to new new horizons and new depths. And that was definitely, uh, you know, his sort of modus in the sense of um, the approach of a lot of like, you know, some of the sounds uh, throughout the throughout the course of um, Last Rites, I also found it to be a time when Dwayne's presence within the band was growing. And it was growing in such a way that um, you couldn't, you couldn't, he couldn't hide, you couldn't hide it anymore, like the, his dominance on some tracks, which I'll get into, um, just signature Dwayne, uh, you know, particularly in Mirror Saw, um, and I'll get into more as well here. Um, but I'll, I'll just start with Love and Bane, since that's like the first track on the album. Um, as I said, it was originally called Hinder. It was written mostly like kind of like in the front lounge with um, with the uh, with the Emacs and featured. Uh, a lot of um, samples that came from, um, believe it or not, this, the, the chorus. Uh, the chorus of uh, Love and Vain was originally a sample that I had twisted up that's, uh, can you see this? Yeah, I don't know how, why that works out, but it's Warhol's Dracula and basically Frankenstein. So what I would do is here, let me just get rid of this. Uh, filter thing here for for a second uh so that you can see you know, what's going on here yeah so uh this album here was pretty instrumental uh as far as like what i was sampling from because i absolutely loved this movie and i think i was like super inspired that i even found this album it's a pretty part of an album i believe these two of themselves um i, I highly recommend um you know, checking out the movies, of course, first, uh, Paul Morrissey films, uh, particularly in 3D, but the musical composed by Claudio Gizzi uh, over the course of these albums is like, well, inspired the hell out of me. And then, so what I would do was I would take a sample, manipulate it, and then quite often, uh, if there was a passage, uh, much like in Shoreline Poison, how I showed you that it's just a sample of a violin from some random radio transmission. It was similar with this, where the chorus of Love and Bane was kind of like the, the violin progression was created uh, from a sample and then sort of like supported by additional keyboard underlays. Uh, the drums um, quite simply uh, starting with S900, but then being doubled by live drums and, and barrels near the reverb chambers in Mushroom Studios. Um, those reverb chambers there were magical. I think if you put anything near them, you know, you didn't even need to go find a reverb. They're just, just beautiful. And um, a lot of the percussive elements of that, uh, you know, were basically, you could create these just cacophonous sort of dynamics within 
the balance of live drums and and the samples. Uh, engineers on the album, of course, Dave Ogilvy Rave and Ken Marshall, and at Mushroom Studios on the custom made uh, Charlie Richmond sound is on board. Um, by this time, everyone had kind of found their niche as far as like what you know what their what, what their role was as far as like bringing in like levels of intensity. And I think like what was cool is that everybody was out to very uh, very much impress in some manner. Um, you know, Dwayne had found his world. I, I want to say, I was looking to this last night that it's possible that the K2000 had come into Dwayne's fingers. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to vision if that was possible. Certainly it became a huge dynamic of the process in the next album after this. But, you know, as Dwayne called it, the K2000 is probably uh, Dwayne's most favorite synth, as he said, that was ever invented. But I almost have to say that I think that, um, you know, the SY-77, the way Dwayne handled it and became sort of a purveyor of that type of wave synthesis, um, you know, it was absolute, he, he was sort of like the king of, of these worlds, it, much like how he was the king of like digital sampling when it all first started. I mean, we used to sort of like sit back and think like, you know, wow, this, you know, how is that being done? And I think in some ways, you know, Dwayne as well was, was wondering, <laughs> at this time, it was like if something could take him to a planet or an exploration of a new world, then you know that was that was definitely you know what 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 Dwayne was going to do. Um, I remember that Dwayne brought in that everything around me moved in slow motion, and in in, in a lot of cases, um, the samples on this album, um, I remember Dwayne seemingly had like a preset arsenal of of stuff, um, some some stuff that like you know obviously it was just absolutely perfect for the moment that a few a few seconds later you could hear such perfectly matching idealisms um it was really funny i was reading this thing um where uh if you go to wikipedia and you start to read like you know what wikipedia says about um about the whole sort of uh album it's funny you know you go read wikipedia about your own album it, it's, it's interesting let's take a look at it okay the seventh album released in march i thought it was actually june 30th but it might be march um resulting in moments of industrial weight as well as some moments of uncharacteristic softness along with containing some of the band's most impenetrable walls of sound uh thank you i mean i i, I actually have to admit that i I hadn't read this, and so when I read it, it's interesting to sort of hear the take, and I often wonder, like, who, who, who writes, who wrote this? Um, it, it, it's a pretty, you know, well, well written um, bio, I will say. And uh, what's what's interesting is that you know when they get into the, the dynamics of the band here about the creation of the album, it says after Skinny Puppy released Two Dark Park in 1990, internal stress began to take its toll on the band. Kevin Key and Dwayne Gettle believe that vocalist Nibek Ogre was more interested in pursuing his solo career than maintaining Skinny Puppy and his abuse of drugs, especially injected cocaine and heroin, exacerbated uh, the, the schism. Manager Mark Jott recalled the time saying they internally combusted to some degree, though the band was still functional and able to record music, much of the friendliness was gone when it came time to work on Last Rites. Well, I guess, you know, this is what I was kind of alluding to about the difficulties I found myself on the Two Dark Park tour, you know, for the first time having to walk away from the intensity of the tour um, and just start walking away. And so for me, I really had this situation where um, it was at that point, moment in my life where I actually thought like I almost changed into a totally different person. And I, I, I became Florida bound. Um, I had met this girl on the, on the Two Dark Park tour that we formed a relationship. And so I started going down to Florida and I, I realized I was wearing like, you, you wouldn't have recognized me. I was wearing like, you know, blue, blue jeans and blue, blue shirts. And not that I was trying to be, and it was like, it was really weird that I was like, that, you know, this person that was like, almost like trying to escape a bit of the horror and the intensity of everything. Um, 
when we got on the road, man, it was, you know, to, to go through the whole sort of experience and then, and then to approach the sort of ideal of making an album based upon what you'd experience. I think that the, the whole experience of making the album of Last Rites was a completely natural progression to what uh, everyone was feeling. And it was a complete expulsion of a lot of emotions. And I do know that like, you know, I know that Ogre was at a, a place of, you know, uh, that, you know, maybe he should be the one to go and, exp and explain, but yeah, it was a dark period for him. And I remember that, you know, there were times, uh, I believe for most of the tour, for Two Dark Park and Last Rides, we were in complete separation from each other as far as like the friendliness had sort of, yeah. But I think, what, you know, what the problem was is really drugs and the way that the whole sort of perspective of drugs create, slammed this analogy on the whole band with everybody. And there was just too much going on at the time to be able to diagnose like how, how, how to digest it all as people. So of course, yeah, you have success, you have all this thing, but you have all these like sort of internal tragedies going on. So it became really difficult. And so the great thing was is that I took a lot of solace in making the album with with Dwayne and Rave and, you know, at the studio, basically it was fun. We had fun. Uh, Fu, uh, Anthony Valsic was a huge component in the album. Uh, we had friends dropping by and hanging out when we were sampling. Um, I remember Tian uh, used to drop by from Network and she's the girl that sampled in Lust Chance. And, uh, you know, all sorts of all sorts of elements which led like there to be actually a really cool vibe also uh, became an intense vibe. It says right here, um, uh, Dave Ogilvy, longtime producer and temporary member of Skinny Puppy during Vivisect acted as a middleman between the two halves of the band. First, he would, would record with Gettle and myself, and afterwards he would bring an ogre and work with him in isolation. This disconnect between Last Rites instrumental composition and vocal recording would prove vital to his discordant sound. I totally believe in that. I think that, um, you know, I, I believe that that, that if, if we're all fine and dandy and all getting along and not having these um, sort of tragedies and traumas and such, that I, I really don't believe that there would have been the outcome of the album. I mean, in, in all essences, um, Ogre has been one of the most pure living artists that I've witnessed as far as like somebody who has expressed themselves from exactly where they were from effectively. And what was the most amazing about Last Rites is that there was a dynamic between um, words and music that was almost like a conversation. And it became um, intense. Um, I think uh, it's alluded to on here that uh, uh, when we speak about left hand shake, that basically um, the dialogue that basically was introduced uh, by Timothy Leary that basically was, uh, here we go, here, a left hand shake. Um, what was interesting about this is it was really not quite intentional, though it seemed um, that the, the, the voices um, and his dialogue were completely addressing something that we were experiencing. Um, uh, tune in, turn on, drop out was um, an album that basically uh, we're, we're making reference to here. Um, Timothy Leary uh, was was really interesting. Is that I don't know if you can see that here. Anyways, Timothy Leary, um, I remember meeting him around later, and he was a completely congenial guy. And uh, I think that when um, you know we had this idea that 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 the, that the song would have this complete connection with something that had been said but has been kind of semi taken out of context is being responded to dynamically by Ogre's vocal. It was like something that I, I had never really experienced or heard. And so we were really concerned about, funny, Skinny Puppy being concerned about sampling. This would be the first sample that we would ever go out and actually try and say, okay, let's get some clearance on this. We had access to Timothy and here, I gotta take off the filter again for you guys to see this. It's uh, really funny. Um, it's it, it's probably something that you know. 
I should, well, it is kind of released here today, but take a look at this. So this letter is an actual letter of permission from Timothy Leary that basically talks about, um, well, here, I can read it to you. Gentlemen, as you know, I'm the writer of the composition and performer of the soundtrack recording entitled Tune and Turn On Drop Out. The soundtrack recording published by blah, 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 1967. You have informed me that you are the writers of the musical composition and performers of the recording called Left Hand Shake. You have advised me uh, that prior to recording the master, you diligently attempted to secure clearance licenses from the publisher and Mercury to include a portion equal approximately three minutes in length to the soundtrack. Uh, that's how much we're using. And our efforts to acquire any uh, such license from the publisher were unsuccessful. Notwithstanding, it is my desire that you include the sample in your master at no cost or expense to you. In consideration for including the sample in your master, I will hold you and your successors and assigners and employees harmless from and against any and all liabilities, damages, costs, or expenses, <laughs> including legal costs and attorney's fees from rising connected with the claim. Sincerely, Timothy Leary. Can you, can you believe that? There it is, folks. So we had permission from Timothy Leary, and you know what this was met with? is that the original publisher, Mr. Henry G. Saperstein, uh, of the of the track, basically came and threatened threatened that, well, you go you go try. And I believe the label was saying, you know, absolutely no way. And so that was the first time that we were met with the wall of like permission being denied and um, and the world of you know where we were now headed. But it's so interesting that you know, as soon as you go try to get permission about something that you run into all this trouble. Forgive me, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go like horsey again if I don't do this. But uh, let's get back to the songs. I think like, you know, Love in Vain is definitely one of my favorite songs on the album. And I really have to say, I was ecstatic to be playing it live on the tour. And unfortunately, um, I guess there is some, issues, uh, you know, where Ogre didn't feel comfortable with the timing of the song or uh, something that made him feel like, you know, he wanted, he didn't want to, you know, if you were playing a set and one song comes along in the set and it's like the song that always makes you stress out, well, that was happening. And so we, as a band decided, okay, well, let's not, let's not do that. And then add to the feeling of where that doesn't happen. I mean, for me, that, that, that would happen. Um, well, especially um, on certain songs. But for me, Love in Vain um, was a chance uh, to build it up. And I think that the way that that song got built up live was something that I was really, really happy with. And hopefully um, we can try and have some, uh, some something coming back for that because that would be joyous. I remember we used to say that all the time, joyous. Um, Okay, let's 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 talk about locations. Yeah, well, the locations. I love this little thing. We always do this. It's funny that on Wikipedia it says, "Okay, locations eleven sixty nine Nelson." That'd be the center. No, that'd be this one. No, that'd be this one right here. The bottom. We're almost at the bottom here. So part of it in Dwayne's apartment, and part of it would be in, in this apartment, fourteen fifty five Robson. Part of it here, and then ending up in Mushroom Studios. So we're still in Vancouver and we're still at the point where I think it's where, you know, we're, we're at the last part of our deal with network. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we were kind of excited about that. And at the same time, I think, you know, we were kind of just proceeding ahead with everything that we knew and everything that we were, you know, becoming comfortable with. Um, I will say that, you know, the band was, uh, was at a weird place. Um, I was going to Jamaica a lot. As I said, I was like going back and forth to Florida. Dwayne was like getting really into, you know, his world. Uh, you know, we were disconnecting in, in some senses of the levels. But at the same time, Dwayne and I were remaining pretty close and it was a pretty damn fun time as far as like the creation period. Um, 
you know, we, we, by this time, uh, I had a studio in my apartment and Dwayne had a studio in his apartment. So we were able to basically, uh, do things at our own pace and introduce them. Um, there's a couple of songs. There's, I think, I think this is a, maybe a manufactured picture. Yeah, this won't, won't, won't blow up for me, but, uh, it's a, I think this is a manufactured picture of, uh, of us, uh, cause I don't remember, I don't remember it. And it's funny that, you know, Rave's wearing the, the Def Jam shirt there, kind of like the eventual demise of, of the band, so to speak, in the sense of, well, I mean, we were all good friends at one point. And then I really do believe that, obviously, when we, you know, got involved with the pressures of the world and touring and everything, and then also a label that would come along and try and disconnect and disassociate uh, components to try and make you all better. Rick Rubin had an idea, you know, to work. Anyways, I won't get into that. I'll get into that in the process. Uh, Dwayne's world was becoming ever more complex as far as like his his deeper abilities with uh, wave synthesis. And uh, it was exciting. Um, I remember this picture was taken out back of the first uh, days, the first sessions of the tour for Last Rites at the Vic Theater was a pretty intense time. Um, this was a vivisected course. Ogre with the classic uh, makeup. I think the show and everything like that, I should talk about in a second, but let's get into the songs as I've kind of skipped here ahead into touring and talking about that. But the killing game. Okay, well, here's, here's something funny. The killing game has, has a funny story. Well, it's not really too funny. This Killing Game is probably one of my most personal songs that I ever wrote. It was a song that um, is almost 99% a day where I went into the room, into the studio, and we, I didn't have a tempo on uh, the sequencer. So I composed this part that would go dun, 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 just as a tempo. And it was in a, it was a particular key. And so basically what ended up happening is I composed basically the whole song around listening to the tempo, sort of like that one note, the throbbing note. And that's why it kind of builds around the up and down of that on and off of that note. It kind of like goes without. But somehow I was able to compose probably one of my most complicated songs um, as far as compositionally. And um, I was saying earlier, you know, when stress out when you come to play live, but this is a song when even though I composed it, I still, I mean, it's not something I can sit down and readily play without like practicing for a while. And then I'll, then I'll be able to possibly do a version of that. But it's not something that like you, I store inside me. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a song that I was in, incredibly proud of, but here's the story. On these discs that you would go and record on in those days, on your Steinberg, on your Atari 1040, I think they hold one megabyte. And so what you would be faced with is when you're going to go save your song, basically, if you don't have any disk space left, typically the only thing you could do is go and erase some other stuff on the disk so that you could create space for you know, the song you're working on. And stupidly, I went in and erased the, uh, the song that I had been working on up to this point, Killing Game and um went to go resave it and the computer crashed so what did i lose i lost pretty much everything except for the sounds that i had all up and the idea in my mind and the fact that i had just lost to me probably one of the most special songs that i had ever written i think i i think i got down on my knees at that moment and and cried for a minute and this is like something that like if you're a songwriter out there and your computer crashes and you know that you didn't have it and it it got it's out that you know that you know that feeling it's devastating and so my whole intention i think i spent about maybe 30 minutes and then i said to myself okay i remember exactly hopefully what i did and i'm going to try and do that again and surprisingly i will say that i'll say this seven eighths of the idea got restored back in there was a magical moment that was in the original that isn't contained in the newer one but 
I'm really happy with how I was able to go back and at least like, like get that idea out enough where I said to myself after I, I literally almost had a nervous breakdown. And I started thinking to myself about the ghost of Mushroom Studios because everyone says it's a ghost of Mushroom Studios. I started thinking about the ghost. I started thinking like, damn you. Um, we, we always referred to him as Ron Tabat from prison. It's like, damn you, Ron. And um, but when I got it restored back and everything, you know, I was happy to see that as you know, as the song built up, uh, it was turning into a monster. And so I was, you know, just incredibly happy to be able to do that. Um, you know, Dwayne didn't add too much except for the SY sound at, at the end. Uh, Rave added the big guitar hit in, in it. And um, oh, it was really funny. There's a really funny story about, about Killing Game is that, you know, it was like a super special song. And um, I think Ogre's vocal performance is like, I can't even say, maybe it might be one of my most favorite vocal performances he's ever done. I, I just can't even put words on how, you know, we would come and hear it the next day because there was a true separation between it. And uh, I, I just was so blown away that I couldn't believe it. But <laughs> I remember that when it went into mixing, uh, Rave called me into the room to OK and mix. And there was this funny expression that we were saying to each other at the time that I won't go into full detail about it, what it was, but it was the equivalent of kiss my ass. Let's just say that what we were saying was a little more detail, a little more graphic. And uh, Rave, if you're listening, you're probably laughing right now, but you made a version <laughs> with a mix where you replaced the chorus with what we used to say to each other. And that was the first mix you played for. <laughs> me as the final mix and I just lost my pants. I mean, I was just, I fell on the floor. I was like, no way. I, that version must exist somewhere, I was thinking. And uh, yeah, no, what, what, come on. We, we, we were at least retained a great sense of humor within Skinny Puppy. And that was one thing I remember in Little Mountain that just was so hilarious. I remember that, um, you know, playing Killing Game live was um was super challenging because you know i was playing it on live drums and just had this like massive tempo metronome in my ear like it was like oh man it was it was the thing that at the end of at the end of the tour if anything did more damage for me to have tinnitus it was that damn click and also i, my, I remember that the headphones i used to wear headphones on that tour and the headphones he, were heating up to a point so much that basically they were like like almost on fire on my on my ears. It was it was ridiculous. It was always like always known for uh, things being uh, too loud and, uh, and and so on and so on. But you know the whole the whole funny thing about the uh, the killing game story is is that I decided to um, progress uh, in life and basically. Um, you know, the next stage in life was, I don't know if you can see this here, here it says, Emacs 2, Last Rights, Kevin Samples, copyright, Skinny Puppy, 1991. So what this is, is this is, I have a number of these, this is a giant 25 megabyte cartridge, 25 megs, people. And, you know, what really bugs me about, about it is, you know, Oh, sorry, folks, it's 44 megabyte, 44 megs. And look at the size of this thing. It's like, so the downside of this is that, you know, here's my samples, the last rights for the better part of them. And, you know, look at this thing. Here, I haul, I haul it out of the garage because of course it doesn't work anymore. But man, thing's a hundred pounds. Look at the size of the, of the, of the disk drive for this thing. The thing's a clonker. And we're talking for 44 megs of samples. So basically, you know, right now, a large part of my samples that I did for that album, um, I have to find a way to get, get them. <laughs> Isn't that a drag? I mean, they're, they're there. You know, I didn't back them up on these, of course, because who would want to use 44 of these to back up one of those? So typically, you know, 
that's how it worked. The, you know, the songs that we sequenced the songs on, you know, would end up in like, like, like songs like, okay, we'd end up with a song called Mushroom or, or a song like here, here's actually the one with the, where it actually became Love in Vain. So, um, you know, this, these days, you know, when you think about like technology and everything like that, that's, that's what I think is one of the, maybe the better achievements is, is, um, is how we were able to make the album or uh, at the time when we're not talking Pro Tools, we're not, we're not even talking to Macintosh, we're talking an Atari computer with live instruments and playing and we're recording a two inch tape. And, you know, in a, in a room that, uh, you know, is, you know, classic old school mushroom room, you know, um, absolutely think, you know, now when I, when I look back on it, I really miss that place. Like, I really wish that, I think one of the biggest mistakes we ever made was not making the process in Vancouver, in mushroom. It was the biggest mistake we ever made. I mean, we, we got comfortable in this room on that board you know basically we could sit here they had no problem about how much weed we smoked <laughs> you know um there was you know hate that how it always shrinks the next pictures now um it it, it, it wasn't a room of high technology as far as like um you know it didn't it didn't have all the this is even newer hmm. oh, shrinky time for pictures okay well Basically, you know, the, the, the place was just like home, so to speak. So it wasn't a place that um, that I think that's the most important element is that when you're making an album, if you're intimidated by the studio, I don't think you're going to make anything good. But uh, this is Charlie Richmond here uh, on the left. And he's the owner of the studio with Will. And um, basically, uh, he basically basically built it. So basically, you know, the room was uh, just a classic classic place to make an album. I think the, I've said it before, the cork, there was like a wood cork walls. It was like a sub below the floor. Um, this this went unused, the screen. I think this maybe came later. That, that wasn't there when we were there. Yeah, the NS10s we used in these big, big wall mounted Yuri 813s. That's where we mixed, you know, anything we mixed uh, in the studio, which is a large part of the albums before this, uh, were all done there. And a great, a great place, you know, Mushroom Studios. But uh, yeah, let's go on here. I, I, I realize I've got a heck of a lot of comments and questions here today. So I got to, you know, move ahead here as quickly as I can. So I don't get caught up. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, it's just one of those things. Nowhere. I mean, I, I can't really, Nowhere is like one of those songs that it's the next song on the list in the album. Uh, the, the working title was canceled and how it started out was, um, was again from samples on the Emacs. So it was like these, the giant cacophonous, uh, kick and uh, sort of like explosion one and explosion two. And that was then sequenced. And then I went out to the room and started playing along to explosion one and explosion two with Dromosaurus. And that became the basis of what would become um, a jam, uh, what would become Nowhere. So the one thing I really appreciate about Nowhere is there is a deep level of Dwayne magnificence in Nowhere that I, I have to say is unique to Dwayne. I've tried to play, um, you know, we, we, we have tried to recreate Nowhere to play live with Skinny Puppy. And there's just no, there was such a, cacophonous amount of play between his samples, but also a melodic structure that is happening on the SY-77 that is almost, you can barely put words to it. Um, it it's what makes the song. Um, for me, this, you know, the, my inspiration was really about um, it being a, it was almost thought as, as metal. Um, I was approaching the song from a drumming perspective. And once I heard what Dwayne was playing, I was kind of like, couldn't believe it. And so luckily the versions of the jams got captured um, and effectively, you, you know, integrated in such a way where there was this perfect marriage of a, a band improvising 
on top of a kind of like rigid bed track of explosions. And uh, it's it just it, it, cacophonous is, is, is really is, you know, I think um, Ogre, Ogre says it right. There's nowhere to run to with this one. And, you know, also the sound, the SY-77, the, I, I know for a fact that that was really like the new beginning of where we're hearing the next level of like where we loved about the ESQ and uh, how detonal it was and how, um, you know, the that type of wave synthesis was becoming ever more, ever more attractive to us. And, you know, as it would continue on into the album, would you know, we'd get deeper. Um, Raven Ogre, uh, when they added the vocal, which would be late at night after uh, Dwayne and I would leave, um, added the chugs. And so I don't know who specifically did what chug or what chug, but I believe they're both possibly credited with some guitar on that. And uh, it became a, you know, sort of like a, a live improv, you might want to say. It's definitely a brap. And, you know, I'm proud of that song because when I listened to this album recently, just to review for the show, um, I'm sort of like taken back by sort of like the overall sort of picture instead of like just listening to the parts. Hey, Mr. Cat, Mrs. Cat, don't knock, don't knock over things. So uh, I, I think that the marriage of the parts in this one um, was really, really, really fun and cool. And uh, yeah, this was a video that was assembled by um, William Morrison, um, I believe for the segment of Nowhere as we performed live and was really cool. Like there was a thing that, um, you know, when we when we went and did the, um, uh, the backing videos uh, for the live show, basically, uh, I think it was the first time where basically these guys had considered um sort of like the idea of integrating footage that ogre would sort of like work with as far as like uh i've got it here i've got something here let's try and get, mute this though because otherwise it could be a little bit uh a little bit hard to hear me but um there was a uh sort of like a virtual reality helmet and uh i think that um the idea of how Ogre would uh, play off uh, live action uh, footage and uh, work within the dynamic of this new world that was coming up. It was like, not only were we playing with um, musical terrains and boundaries that were for us being conquered. I mean, for us, I mean, making an album was like, where is this gonna go? I truly believe we had no idea where Last Rites would go. And as soon as Mirasaw came along, um, this is one of Dwayne's previous compositions that, you know, as soon as I heard it, I was like, I just knew right, right away. I was just like very taken back by, you know, the beauty of the samples, the vocal sample that stretched in the middle and, and uh, the beauty of some of the things. And there was a very minimalist drum track, which left it wide open to add what I might want to call the in the air tonight phil collins uh, acoustic live drumming um super in your face bright live and um this was something that uh I, I, it just was something that i you know right off the bat in previous times if there was ever a time where you start adding parts or doing things like that you maybe would have considered about programming you would have considered about you know this world but now the world had tuned into this new world where triggered radios and um and cacophonous uh, you know metallic explosions and, and somewhat could be sort of like the goal because i do believe by this point we had intersected with um uh and Neubauten and so basically had some sort of like experience as far as like you know where you know it was like this new level of obtained i'm you know certainly meeting up with test department and i was just annoyed about in 1986 um i got things from both bands i took uh, huge takeaways where you know the pickle barrels and the, the microphone inside barrels and all the mics sort of like dirt 
my dirt and, and scraps of stuff on the floor that became hugely forefront in my mind to percussive elements that I would try in the studio as you know not just like drum set elements and you know that got played out um uh through this album and into last man to fly with tear garden which we also were making right around the same time matter of fact the question was raised what album was done first and i actually believe that it had to have been the tear garden so in this series um i think i skipped ahead one album but that's okay i'll um i'll tell you later as to how i've proven that fact but uh yeah, the choral melodic world of, of Dwayne was 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 uh, out of control. What's become of me and you? I always will have a takeaway lyrically uh, in it. There, there will be a moment where I will say, that's a deep message, or maybe it felt like it at the time. And I will say, you know, one of the great things is that, you know, though Ogre and I have had a 40 year disconnect most of the time for making intense music and having experiences that, you know, they are what they are, but it's great to be able to share this recent history with Ogre where we've been at a very good level. And so I'm really happy to be able to speak about this in a, in a hindsight manner. And uh, um, my, my whole perspective is to show, um, I have a huge amount of respect for everybody that was involved with the making of this album. Um, it was a team and without everybody involved uh, doing what they did, I don't think the album would have turned out the way that it was. I think that there is still a disconnect between certain people and I think it's really sad, but you know, this is something that they choose, more like one person has chosen uh, to hold on to for more than nearly 30 years. And so it doesn't really, to me, um, it just it's just sad because there's no relevance in who we are as people today or you know what we feel about you know gen in general things the respect we might have for uh the project and for the people involved so anyways i i have a big love for um the roles that everyone played um the next song uh, was an apartment song of mine uh originally titled cat bowl i mean what a greater title than that you can have for a kevin demo uh, uh, later now known as Inquisition. Uh, this song was a song that I was really getting into experimenting with the, the idea of programming those breaks with the drums. Um, I had come up with um, earlier experimentations with 16ths, 30 seconds and 64ths within the programming of drums. And I thought like, okay, this is something that I still wanted to, um, you know, get into. It was really my main essence of what you know, Cat Bowl, AKA Inquisition, excuse me, was all about. Um, the bass groove was an Emacs sample and um, just looped, um, you know, with um, huge drums, of which again, mostly are live from the Drumasaurus, uh, doubling from the original program drums. So it was like program S900 with all the craziness and, um, just crazy, yeah, crazy drum breaks. I, you know, at the time I thought like, wow, nobody's gonna be able to get this, but it seems to make perfect sense now. And and I really feel sorry for uh, Justin when we have to play this because it's like, you know, it's difficult, it's difficult to create, you know, recreate it. Can you hear my cat just scratching away at the couch over there? <laughs> just classic. Thank you, Tiger Lily. Yes. Um, I think that um, the, the, you know, the duck, the typical duck, duck samples, like, take your soul, I'll swell your soul. Like, it just would always come up with the perfect vibe for uh, whatever that, you know, whatever the song was at that point. And I think that's like, we basically just sort of had this like idealism that if I came with a pretty well fleshed out song or created a very well fleshed out song, you know, like Killing Game or like Inquisition, then now Dwayne was coming along, along with really fleshed out songs like Mirror Saw, or um, download, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, Scrapyard is, you know, it's like one of my favorite songs on Last Rides is Scrapyard, uh, originally called Hurtful Too, um, was uh, one of my demos, but it was very raw in comparison to what it would become. 
So of course the song was based around improvising on top of a very broken uh, like drum rhythm that um, was again played on top of and it was almost like again the essence of metal because I had no idea what what the song was or you know what this world was but what was really great about it was when you know when I got into a room with Dwayne and you start to hear like obviously all the essences of of his world of, of sounds but it was also married with an enormous amount of radio samples like I mean just like the most random stuff that you can hear coming in and out and what made that great was the editing by Anthony Velsic Fu was the one that brought it brought kind of like the magic to the song um I remember that I first was hearing that it was going to go that way and so I said okay and so like the first break I said let's throw in some acoustic guitar so the first little thing is like a little acoustic guitar break and then back into the song and then the second one was like into a radio into a radio and then Fu completely surprised me because it was something that I used to say all the time I don't know why I kind of like felt like I have these repeat I used to say I have Tourette's I'm Rana says I don't I think I do but I get these things locked into my system where I'll say I used to say LG 73 all the time to people and it didn't really mean anything except all good you know that's that's kind of like what it meant to me was hey hey all good you know and I guess that's what people like took it as too I hope I hope that's what they took it as but um you know it was kind of uh funny that like foo basically um oh what's that place? it's a monstrous noise sorry foo basically just i threw a surprise in there to somehow how, how he found uh the radio dj with the saying lg73 and he threw it in there Foo, i love you for that man that was one of the greatest you see we always have this sense of humor like the rave thing throwing in like the thing that we used to say that we didn't keep but this one of course we kept and I always thought that that was just brilliant. And I started, you know, the door opening was also another food thing, like where a door, a door opening and closing. I think I suggested that, but Foo found the perfect sound. Um, there's a plethora of noise in the song that I think that, you know, it, it, it was like a new, a, a new place that Skinny Puppy could go that, um, that I didn't find recognizable. I did, it wasn't like, you know, um, it, it wasn't a world that I knew anyways. And I liked where it was going. And it's like, I don't know, one of these things where, why don't they ever put the volume on these things? There it is. You know, by this time, as the, as the album's coming together, I'm starting to say to myself, wow this album is really different i don't know how different but it you're just going to go with the flow and then comes along um this group called la 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 human steps in canada this was kind of a known uh dance troupe from montreal uh headed up by a guy named edward Locke, and most notably um a uh feature of the dancing a, a fabulous lead named louise le cavalier and Louise uh, was a very violent dancer and basically had this, um, I, I, I'd gone and seen them with Myra Davies once and I was completely blown away. So um, Anshu Zandi Neubauten was scoring their, uh, their tour of 1992. And they came to us right during the middle of the recording of Last Rites and said, uh, we'd like you to make a song or two for us for our show. And they, they had an okay amount of budget. So somehow we got convinced to go into a mode where uh, we would begin making some music for their set. And it kind of sidestepped the idea of the album. And that's how The River's End came to be. Um, obviously, the, the River's End is a mashup um, between the song Rivers from Rabies and uh, um, it also has Coral, Coral One or Coraloni, depending on how you call it, also from Ravy, sort of like mashed into one idea. I think the idea was to, um, to make something that they had suggested to us that they had enjoyed. And so we kind of went with it by the idea 
that we could make this idea and then somehow improvise on top of that, which is exactly what we did. So I went in and added um, massive live drums. Um, most of the live drumming you hear on it is the metal barrels, the yellow barrels, the barrels that were given to me for a test department, barrels that were given to me by Neubauten, and um, duck noises, uh, mostly the uh, SY again coming in, uh, the Segway inter interior of Coraloni, sort of like breaking in there with the classic Duane samples of the choral stuff. You know, um, that was like classic Duane moments. Um, and I remember we did this and we did two other songs, one that was a take on West Side Story, and then one was another take on something we didn't get it. Neither of them were included on the last rights album. And um, we finished it, sent it to them, and then they didn't pay us. And <laughs> I remember that uh, we got pretty upset at them about it because they had paid answers and annoy about in something like $60,000 to score a better part of their show and had, couldn't pay us. I think they offered us $6,000. And we found out all this later. And then it was basically not only it was, it was weird too, because we we're a Canadian band and La 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 is also Canadian and wouldn't, wasn't paying a Canadian act that they could have easily received funding from Canada Council for and were loading up or annoy about them. and you know we love noy about we were a huge friendship with uh with the, with the guys in the band at this point and uh i will say that there were key moments of the tour of uh the last rights tour that i remember um i should send annoy about them coming backstage and you know when those guys come backstage it's kind of like gives you that feeling like you've done something right um in that sense, but I will say, I think I maybe said it before, but there was a lot of improvisation on elements of the tour. And, you know, by the time we were playing live um, uh, in LA, I think we did two nights at the Palladium. It's like 4,000 people a night. Some of our bigger shows in LA, um, probably the second show um, played it. And there, I remember just feeling incredibly good about it came off stage and the very first person to come off stage, she was Terry Bozio. And I thought like, wow, hey, hey. And he's like, dude, you just killed it. And I thought like, wow, I, I even said to him, oh, that's a compliment coming from you, right down. And uh, he said, no, you you fucking killed it. And he, funny, he was standing with uh, Perry, Perry Farrell and he said, you know, similar thing. And they both hugged my sweaty self. And I thought like, wow, it must have been good if they're going to hug me when I'm sweaty. And uh, so, you know, when you're talking about getting compliments from the likes of those two fellows, I think like, you know, um, you, know you, you know, it's like the, the, them, them's like the, the compliments, that's for sure. It's funny, I ran into Terry Bozio's son a few years back at one of the parties at, at a party at Danny Carey's house. And... Um, Someone said, hey, did you know that Terry, that's Terry Bozio's kid? And I said, oh, God, no, I didn't. I said, but his dad gave me one hell of a compliment one time. And he turned to me and said, he sure did. <laughs> Remember that, Rihanna? <laughs> yeah, how can I not forget that? Yeah, yeah. So Rihanna didn't like it because he became like a, as a little puppy dog, as Rihanna calls it, uh, that night. Uh, but, oh, yeah. he was like, legs. <laughs> but, you know, um, that's okay you know what what can you say about a guy that you know digs you know digs digs it I, you know i was actually thinking that terry bozio and the Fantomas set live in switzerland if you guys have never seen that go check out mike Patton and the Fantomas set with terry bozio live live in switzerland after this chat and tell me that's not one of the greatest drumming performances of all time ever on tape so yeah onward uh, Lust Chance. You know, I love this song, Lust Chance, originally entitled Fester. Again, it came from a variety of samples and a variety of samples from all over the place. Um, I remember that um, I was sampling a lot off of chilling, thrilling sounds of the haunted house. I remember as well, I was also sampling from 
you know, records like uh, Videodrome. Um, I didn't sample from Eraserhead, I don't think. Me, uh, Rosemary's Baby, the score of Rosemary's Baby. Uh, how about the score of Dark Shadows? Dark Shadows. How about this one? Spooky sound effects. Yep. Or, you know, Rollerball. Yep, the score of Rollerball. Or how's about even The Shining? Vinyl. So these type of things, you know, they, they were like, you know, there's a lot of a lot of times where there was things being spun backwards and and uh, you know, you know, basically uh, all sorts of stuff. Mostly turntablism, as they call it, I guess. Yeah, turntablism. But anyways, uh, last last chance was a thing where I made a ton of pieces with a beat, and it was the first time that I left sort of like a a component of an idea with Ken Marshall. And I said, let's put this into something and see what you come up with. And it, when it all came together, that's what happened is less chance came together out of an I had the first sort of collab that I ever did with Ken. And it's sad because, you know, I really used to make reference to Ken for years after that. I used to say, Ken, let's do another less chance. But um, uh, yeah, I won't go into that. The tape of Tian is basically the uh, the sexy lady's voice. Uh, Tian was one of the secretaries and a very good friend of ours. Was often in the studio. Big up Tian. Um, uh, also, uh, so Warhol samples and nineteen uh, uh, LG seventy three. I mean, if it's gonna make it into a song, there. I think I just said that it was in uh, the last song, but no, it's in Lust Chance. Uh, Foo edit once again with uh, the huge that section of the noise that builds up is it just a huge delay feedback sort of like crescendoing feedback and sort of like these type of ideas are mostly created only in the world where you're collaborating with engineers and editors and uh, yeah, great track I always have loved Lush Chance Circus Stance uh, original um, originally called Premonition was a song is a Dwayne song and it was largely constructed by Dwayne samples again that he had been taking this is why I want to say the K2000 because there's a, there's an enormous amount of stretching and crazy stuff that's going on with with this song um there was only one way for me to approach it and that was um I heard it as a metal song especially the ending the bass part at the ending just seemed like a, an, an anthem it was just like a huge opportunity to make it anth anthemic, so to speak. Um, you know, the sort of S SY77 textures in it again, um, diabolical sort of segments, and basically, you know, the middle break with the laugh, how it was like, kind of like, you know, what we what type of reaction we could typically get from people when we would sort of like play this type of music to people was a laugh. And so the laugh break was was sort of like playing into, um, you know, where this will go. I remember playing this song live. And again, it was incredibly complicated to play live. Um, it was it was insane. But if we could pull it off, you know, it was it was incredibly fun. You can see Ogre there with with what, what we refer to as the carousel. Um, it was like the carousel of spinning heads. And uh, uh, an immense setup for both Dwayne and I. I think Dwayne had like, you know, 20 keyboards or so up there and all sorts of like video stuff that he could uh, play live samples from and so on like that. It was, it was incredible. God, I'm never gonna get to the comments. Well, I gotta do what I gotta do, right? Rihanna's like, this is gonna be a long chat. I'm like, okay, it'll be what it is. Uh, let's talk about download. I mean, ep originally entitled Epilogue 2, this song was something that um, I can't really put words on the surprise of how this song played out. Um, I literally have zero to do with it. And it was a song that was created late at night, but well, maybe I do have something to do with it by way of the pieces that the guys sampled from. But basically what it is, is, is 
Anthony Valsic and Dwayne sat up one night in Mushroom Studios when they decided to do some acid. And I'm pretty sure that Dwayne's idea was, he was intrigued by the idea of sort of like fast forward CD skipping and the sound that he could obtain by that. And there's a large part of these elements that are contained in sections. But then there's also elements where there was a lot of like, you know, really creative foo editing. And, you know, in some ways, I want to say, I want to say it's like the revolution number nine of last rites. And I know that we were incredibly inspired by revolution number nine, all of us. And basically this is the closest thing that I can see um, as to making it like a true audio sculpture. Um, you know, I don't know where the sample came from. It felt as though my chest would just fall open, but that was another Dwayne, you, you know, just, just, just whole, sort of essence of now Dwayne sort of like expressing, like he used to go into flotation tanks around this time. And he was really interested in the idea of out-of-body experiences. And it became more and more and more so as time came on. And what is really interesting is a lot of people have asked, well, what about the ending? You know, there's like at least a six or seven minute long ending that is basically a pro one synthesizer filter being played by none other than the legendary Pink Dots member, Martine Declare. Yes, that has absolutely nothing to do with I or Dwayne. And in fact, Martine Declare is one of these guys that, if you uh, watch Nine Lives to Wonder, the thing you can see, his craftsmanship as far as his guitar playing at this point was at a level of, he, he was at Dwayne's level. And it's not as though he took part in the recording. I, this was a recording he had done that Dwayne and uh, Fu had taken and applied to the song. So, you know, all in all, that's how the song was created. And then afterwards, there were so many discussions after where I said to Dwayne, we should create a whole project like this. You know, th this should be a whole, you know, basis of a whole project. And though it didn't really become the basis of the project, it was the impetus of discussion, I remember, that I had with Mark Spivey and everything about, you know, where that song had gone and kind of like, you know, taking it into a new world. You know, I kind of have to say that if you listen to Circus Stance and you don't hear left hand shake before download, it really doesn't make nearly as much sense. Left hand shake is sort of like, after Circus Stance is sort of like, it's left you in this cathartic, like world of just like confusion and left hand shake is the confrontation. Yeah, Rihanna's giving me the alert that I need water. Water break, let's all take a sip. Yep, by the way, you are watching segments of Last Rites Live. And uh, left hand shake was something that if you heard the album before they basically removed Left Hand Shake, you would think like, how could they do that? Because it really is like the story of the album. If you're able to listen to uh, the album with Left Hand Shake, I believe there is one online where you can. It, it just makes so much more sense. Some have said, including the Wikipedia, that it's an internal battle between the band and Ogre does seem to be basically responding to what uh, Timothy is saying. Um, you know, other than the bass line, the wicked bass sequence that Dwayne sort of implies, uh, it was entirely composed with live drums and used to be something that we did play the song live on the last rights tour. And I would say it's incredibly ferocious to play. They thought, I remember it used to be the song where I felt like the pit used to be the biggest out of anything that I could remember from the last rights tour was um, you know one of these songs that he would look forward to playing sink into dark i mean it was easily one of the most darkest songs confession a battle your fears are my ambitions i mean ogre couldn't have said anything i think that is just so true to the song 
And then at the end, Ch uh, Larry says, are you ready? Then take this chalice, the elixir of life. It was almost like, like our remedy for most things. And my remedy, when at least when I got into heavy drugs, was my only way out was getting back to just smoking weed. And that's that was basically, you know, you know how I got out. But basically, I think that that was sort of like alluding to that. Uh, Wreck was the original title of the uh, demo of Left Hand Shake. Uh, Mirror Saw Dub. Uh, you, it's so nice to hear the separate sounds of the gated strings and, and basically sort of like a breakdown. And basically, you know, Uranus canceled and uh, sort of like Mirror Saw Dub is really like... Um, you know, a way to sort of like take advantage of like components of that track and the unconventionalness of it and try and work with uh, work with other things. I'm being handed a note. No, I'm not going to make this into a two part. You see, Rihanna's always like, come on, honey, be supportive. Well, your voice is going. Well, and uh, you have to answer I, 100 and something questions. I really, I really do believe that we're actually at a point here where we can talk uh, with other people and introduce things such as this. The left hand shake, uh, once it was taken from the album and uh, basically um, released, was released on this lovely 10 inch single, only official release, and it was released at the Doomsday performance in Dresden, Germany. I believe there was something like 600 of them or a thousand made or something, and they mostly sold out there at the show. And uh, yeah. That's basically um, the only place that, you know, you basically can buy it or, or could have bought it. Um, I believe they sold it online. What's weird is that I had several, I guess, stolen from my house. I have no idea where well, we used to have a few kicking around, but you know, they are no longer around. So I just have one. Um, yeah, I was going to show you guys um, a couple of the things about the artwork. Um, Let's get rid of this filter again, because it's so difficult to show you guys things. Um, I think I think I've showed you guys this before, but there was nothing greater than you know seeing like the the inevitable um, painting as done by Jim Cummins. I mean, this painting uh, is done by hand. There's no. Um, you know nothing digital about it in any way. Um, it's nice that it's a bit chunky, you know, like like a lot of Jim's stuff. You know, I love that it's glossy as shit too. It's like it could the shine on it is great. It's in great condition. Uh, believe it or not, I bought it in a gallery that was, Jim put it up for sale, and I just went in there and quickly bought it. I believe it's like where should he sell it for? Thirteen hundred fifty. I think he gave me a deal. No, but yeah, I did. I did have to buy it. And uh, you want to fix that one? What was what was great about that though is that um, you know the original cover of Last Rites when I would, went to Jim's house, he was working on this for the longest time, and I really loved it. It was you know kind of like has that SP shape on those vines down here, and has the guy on top of a hill. It was really cool. And then inevitably, this didn't end up getting used. But I, I remember saying to him, "Hey, where's that?" Where is that? And I, I think I ended up buying, well, I did end up buying this, but I, was it in that show? I don't know. Anyways, I ended up buying this uh, from him at the same time. And it's one of those things that I love them both. It's just got to love Jim. You know, Jim's sort of like persona and um, his whole, you know, his whole take on everything. Uh, was what was important and, and I think that you know the cover kind of like perfectly it's kind of like zeroed in on on the album even though he didn't have a chance to hear it so I think that was uh, kind of kind of kind of a, a feat in itself and especially happened to follow up Chew Dark Park I know that you know he kind of like felt maybe a bit of pressure he kind of like created the um you know the the classic skinny puppy logo but to follow it up um with this painting i think was 
was was pretty classic and these you know set of uh merchandising for the tour um there was this uh, you know kind of like the official cover and then there was the gym covers which i had the more handwritten uh gym designs la human eight was a song that um uh, you know being in the studio was uh, again another improvisation and was uh i remember that it it was the only one that featured the 808 and going back to the pro one and with use, utilizing the old school setup and i remember i read something about ogre saying something about he felt he almost died during the recording of la humanate and basically i believe that that i believe he said it says in the Wikipedia that he checks himself into uh, a rehab until the until the last rights tour. Even cassette came out on cassette. You know, Jim, like legendary Vancouver figure. Um, you know, his paintings always just inspiring. And this one I have, it's just so thick. You know, it's always just great. Great personality, look how thick that paint is. Some great images. This is an enormous painting that I have of his that's in my hallway over there. It's like about, I think nine feet tall by nine feet wide. It scares the hell out of me every time it falls down. Yeah, this painting here is about what, six feet by six feet. But uh, if you're interested to hear more about Jim Cummins, there's a chat. Which I'm here on Patreon, just go and plop in iBrainator and uh, learn more about Jim and his classic, his whole classic world of art. And Jim is still ongoing. Um, basically, he's doing shows all the time still. He is, um, he's still very active. And so if you're in Vancouver, ask somebody when's Jim doing his next show? because it's, it's, it's totally worth going up, man. I noticed that what I love about all of Jim's paintings is they always have these amazing mountains in it. And, you know, that's something that if you look at Last Rites, it's super part of like, you know, you know, the whole work and what, it, what it's all about. But uh, what a classic time working with Jim on the cover. And uh, yeah. What about the classic one? What's that? Oh, that one. So this is uh, one that Jim done recently. You can see it has the classic mm -hmm. Last Rites Hills uh, in the background as well. Pretty classic. Here, would you like to take that lovely Rihanna? Yeah, one thing about the, um, you know, the tour is that, you know, as we got into it, we started collaborating with a guy named the legendary Tim Gore. And uh, what would it be without uh, the guilt suit and uh, all the great things that Tim has done uh, with skinny puppy over the time and you know bringing this is what he looked like at the time and then this is what he looks like now what do we do to you tim <laughs> anyways tim if you're interested in more uh, the world of tim gore and what he did with us that's also here uh on uh, we went through the shows and talked about all the great stuff that he's done with hellboy and all the rest of that and yeah tim gore a huge component of the last right show and of the crew fantastic component of, of our ability to kind of like achieve achieve stuff. I remember that was uh, quite amazing. I remember that uh, when we uh, when we we're on the road, there was a couple of things that happened that I remember when we rolled through uh, Lawrence, Kansas, basically uh, somebody came by and said, hey guys, I want to take you guys to this place. And they took us to a place called Stull. And what's weird is that I've looked this up and what I've seen is that I don't think this place exists anymore. I think they tore it down. And so of course, Skinny Puppy is taken to a place. They say it's one of the seven entrances to hell. So of course they have to take us there. I snapped this <laughs> photograph. And as I was walking across this grass oh. to said location, about a seven foot long black snake crossed my path. And I said, this, this, this is weird. I attribute bad luck to us visiting this place. 
and you bring uh, home an organ from there then? no i have an <laughs> organ from there but it's from lawrence kansas i found it on the street there uh actually i was just walking on that same street just recently when we played i believe the granada is it the granada and uh, i found this organ in an antique shop and i've referred to it ever since as a stull organ um it was incredibly uh sap it was sampled on um love and vain you know the organ that you hear on there and some of the other um bombastic kind of organ that you hear throughout i've also had to fix it a few times it's entirely made of wood and leather so it's a pump organ it's a harmonium basically absolutely love it though and uh, I heard Dave Gahan likes Last Rites. Is that true? I don't know if Dave Gahan really likes Last Rites or not, but thank you for whoever submitted that for the chat. Thank you, Penelope, too, for submitting the, uh, the fantastic um, backdrop that I've had going for today's uh, chat that is uh, magically able to appear and disappear. Um, it, of course, features the work of Tim Hiho Hore, that's what we used to call Tim, on the road. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it disappears on me. I just love how Patreon just moves your virtual backgrounds once, you, once you've got it set up and then it just moves it. Yeah, well, no big deal. Here it is. Um, believe it or not, I do not have a picture cover sleeve of the original Last Rites. It's that rare. Can you believe that? No. Nope. Nope. All I have is the what's known as the re-release. So this is like the double vinyl that Network re-released. Uh, I'm going to say officially because it comes with a CD. It's in a really nice packaging, actually. Um, you know, yeah. It's pretty nice. Oh, you can't even see it. Well, there it is. It's got a CD. It's got vinyl. It's got the nice inserts. It's got the nice black logo, all that stuff. But believe it or not, all I have, folks, is the promo. All I have is the skinny puppy. I might have a couple of them. But, That's you why know, I'm surprised that you don't have it because you always have at least a couple of every I know everything. But then one thing that Rihanna and I realize is that I also don't have a copy of the Inquisition 12 inch. It's true. Which when we went to look for it last night, we're like, wait, we don't even have a copy of that. And I think it's because it came out at a time when CD singles had just started coming out. And so the world of CD was kind of like quickly taking over. And so I thought like, OK, well, Maybe I'll get that later. And then it just, you know, it never happened again. I thought that was really weird. But, uh, you know, even weirder is that, you know, Skinny Puppy and their tour of Last Rites would actually end up with, you know, with, with Skinny Puppy in Hawaii. Who would ever consider that Skinny Puppy could end up in Hawaii? I mean, I just thought that that was just a totally wacky thing. And especially now considering that you know we went and played i think it was like three shows in hawaii at a place called pink's garage in honolulu and i remember the first show was absolutely atrocious uh, we had some technical problems but i remember the second show was really nice and so i was really proud of that one and uh you know think about overdoing this in in the heat, heat of hawaii i just thought that was just amazing yeah, as I said, I was living in Florida at the time. That was my girlfriend, Teresa there, and Dwayne, and this is like other Florida people um, when we were playing at the Last Rite show there in Florida. We were touring with Godflesh on this tour, and I will say as bandmates on tour, uh, wonderful, wonderful classic guys. Also spoke with Justin Broderick here. <laughs> about his whole adventure with Skiny Poopy on tour with us in 1992 with his bandmate here, Ben. Um, yeah, absolutely loved it. Yeah, that's the chair of no cares. This thing here, basically, it was this massive prop and it was so, was so heavy that basically um, it fell backwards one night, I believe, 
through uh, a very expensive screen and we had to pay something like just thousands of dollars for said screen. So what would, what would, would always happen is that we'd never be able to end up really, I don't even remember making money on this tour. I remember that I had to pay for a better part of like the drums that I had to use. And so I ended up walking away from this tour, like I don't even think making money. And that was kind of, you know, the, the sign of the times really you know, really that there wasn't a lot of, um, we, you know, I remember that we didn't gauge things so much by money in those days. It wasn't like the talk about it was, was less. I mean, we, we'd go out on the road for a per diem, basically. This is an actual shot of them from the Skinny Puppy Tour, pretty awesome. And one of the posters from City Limits there, Wake Up to God Flesh, yeah. Yeah, so, oh God, it's been an enormous amount of time and I've been talking here for for a while here. Yeah, no, we got to go to uh, what we now know as the uh, the questions from you guys. Let's see what we got here. Um, I know that there's an enormous amount of, of them. And uh, let's just no better way than to get started. And you know, if I've caught if I've covered your question in, in in today's like so already sort of like discussed stuff, I'll, I'll just sort of skip ahead, okay? You remember the source for the spoken samples and download? Um, as I said, that was a typical Dwayne thing at this point. My stomach would just fall open. I I don't. It's possible that info may be obtainable online, Stephen. Looking forward to this show. I got a couple burning questions. Was the base arpeggio at the end of Inquisition made with the SY77? I believe that's the Pro One. But um, if I listen to it again, it's that. Dun, 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 uh, you know, that's a good question. It could. It could have been. Um, you know, I don't have the master. Uh, tapes of Inquisition. Um, other people do, as you've recently seen. Um, I wish they would share it with me so that I could then go in and and get more into that. We could we could really utilize those 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 sessions um, when we want to go do a song for live. But uh, as it is, we've had other challenges to try and play Inquisition live. It's 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 one of the ones that we could really use uh, some of the original master tapes that we currently don't have. I don't currently have. Uh, Skinny Puppy over here does not have. Did you have to clear the samples uh, for the album? As I said, we went into the left hand shake thing, kind of crazy, and lastly was the reverse sample. In, what is it in Mirror Saw? You tell me. God, that's like the, that's gonna go down with Dwayne. You know, these, these are the mysteries of the Dwayne world that I love. Uh, thanks for the question, Larry. Crap, now I got to think of some questions. Okay. Well, Larry, did you think of one? <laughs> uh, Matt Woodward, uh, Last Rites reminds me of, sound, of a soundtrack to someone that lost their mind and identity due to some sort of trauma and grief. I passed the point of no return. Uh, Mirasol, was this song personal reflection of, of losing somebody or abandonment? Well, lyrically, um, I can't really speak to it. But, you know, as far as thematically, it, it's a Dwayne song. So again, I can only say that, um, you know, I don't want to say I'm the Phil Collins in that song, but I guess I'm the Phil Collins. Jeremy Morlock, it is my memory correct that Dwayne was wearing a baseball jersey on stage at the show in Lawrence. Everything in that show was legendary, the wall of sound. You know, Dwayne used to wear uh, by the Last Rites tour was fully, had just had just sort of immersed into the beginnings of techno. We had just heard ASEN uh, at the, on this tour and I saw Dwayne's wardrobe change overnight. Uh, Paul, uh, this was the album that first blew my mind and got me hooked. I saw you on your fort in Chicago. Best live show I've seen, Scrapyard or River's End, two go-to songs, blah, blah, blah. Four questions, is there any chance more of this album like Scrapyard might get a replay live. I think Scrapyard is something that needs those edits in it to make it work. Um, we've never tried that though. We don't have the components to do it. 
like original loop or anything like that. La Humanate is my favorite B-side. Yeah, that's a great song. It was like a classic for us to make as well. One of these things where it's, a, you know, a true collaborative between myself and Dwayne on that one. Song released uh, by Seven Solo, No More Ghosts has some similar drum sounds. It is from the same sessions. Good ear on that. And uh, No More Ghosts is the only song written entirely on the SP-1200. Also a killer track. The song Scared from Back and Forth says 1992. Yes, it is from the Last Right session. Boy, guys on it here. Minimum Riffage. Uh, my intro uh, to SP in grade 10. What a great a grade to get uh, introduced. I had the CD that had all the track listings, timings mixed up. Oh yeah, that did happen upon its release. Plus it had the Inquisition CD single, art printed on the disc. Very confusing. My question is, were the disparate sounds of the first section of download supposed to be mimicking the actual file in the downloading? Yeah. I recall the early days of the internet. Yes, I believe that what you're tapping into there is the same thing that Dwayne is referring to, was the future of the whole world of downloading and the essence of high speed transfer and all the rest of that. But you know, at that time, um, you know, when we, even when we named the band download, the, really the expression wasn't utilized that much at that point. Otherwise we wouldn't have called our band that. So really it was an expression uh, that was yet, yet to come at the time when this was happening. You gotta consider this was 1991. Uh, Maggie. This album uh, rules so fucking hard. Question at 245 on Scrapyard. Is that a sample of Uncle Buck? I've heard that it is. So let's let's go with Uncle Buck. You know, how we end up with Uncle Buck is a good question. But uh, Dwayne did the samples at that point, And so Dwayne will take responsibility for Uncle Buck. Erisic Grove, listening to Circus Stance for the first time was when I realized I absolutely love Skinny Puppy as much as I can love anything. Thank you. Any stories relating to its creation? Well, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, Circus Stance was this song that came from Dwayne's world. And when I started hearing how it would play out, especially with that ending, I thought like, I never heard anything like this. Well, I'll just go with the flow. And, you know, if I was going to add noise or I was going to add something to it and it worked, then great. And there was a big chance in those days if you add something to something like this, it wouldn't work. So I'm just thankful that a lot of stuff worked. I think I mentioned uh, Revolution Number 9, our inspiration. I believe that were we so bold as to sample it, it could be. I can't remember doing, I can't remember doing that. So I'm going to say I don't think we directly sampled it, but there's something that sounds kind of like it. Uh, Love and Bane, uh, Joey, Love and Bane is uh, one of the most solid opening tracks of any album I've ever heard. Was there ever any question in the process of recording the album, the song wouldn't be the lead in, huh? Well, the thing is, it was the first song written too. So it was the first song I wrote. And so I think there was a like a good feeling and response uh, about it. And it kind of like just had that whole wind the record player up let's go type feeling to it that it was like really sort of like classic pete i cannot wait for this one this was a soundtrack of my late teens listening to it often on the loop frequently paired with disintegration by the cure and over 25 years later it's still among my favorite albums despite the cacophony i used to fall asleep too frequently just clicked uh, with the gray matter would be interested in hearing a bit about the track left hand shake um I think I've been gone into that here. Hopefully that was uh, suitable. I used to really like doing the drumming on that, mainly because it was very, to me, uh, inspired by um, how metal would do pickups sometimes, kind of would have a skip. I was really into sort of like the idea that I could play with that within uh, the framework. Can't tell you how excited I was. When that track hit the internet, I immediately turned a CD uh, nestled with its proper right home. Yeah, I encourage people to do that. You know, since the world's full of like, uh, you know, that's how it is, then that's how I would, I would say, just go out and do it. Uh, Sean, I don't even know where to start or end on that matter. This album, I challenged a young mind in 1992 
to what music could be. It was my introduction to change everything. Thank you. Eric Clay, one of the absolute favorites. Apologies in advance if you're sick of this, but is there a chance that Left Hand Shake might see a wider release? Well, as you see, we've got Timothy's uh, permission. Maybe uh, Henry will lighten up. Uh, Matt G, a huge, a huge fan of the album. Not sure if there will ever be a remix to Stemper Chat. I don't know about that, but I was curious what you thought of the Autekra Killing Game remix. Uh, I thought it was quite funny. They said Network uh, didn't give them many stems. Um, I don't think that's true. I think that, honestly think that at that time, Autekra just didn't probably know what to do. I mean, my God, Autekra doing a Killing Game remix? I mean, uh, that had to have been an idea of Dwayne in mind, but I just, it kind of is a silly idea. And I think that they did a perfectly suitable thing, actually. So I kind of applaud them for doing what they did. Uh, music, musical Anarchy. Doug Taylor, excited to hear how Circus Dance came about. I think we uh, have gone over that. Tim Q? Tim O T. First time I heard Last Rites was an event. I was attending university at the time, and my friends were at home. We all planned to drop acid. Good thing. Oh, I can't imagine hearing this album on acid. I've never personally done it. And uh, have the same time experience later when I was done with school. I was in biopsy class. Biology class, sorry. I dropped at 8 p.m. and finished class. Everyone at home dropped at 8. It was great acid. And made it home after watching the microbes and the microscope expand and the room bend into a spiral. I joined my cohorts as we listened to Last Rites. This album is marked on my soul. Well, I think like download has to do something to anyone on acid. It just absolutely has to. Uh, the most important is question on from Bird Spanker is who is the genius behind the Uncle Buck howling bill sample? Well, that has to be Dwayne or it has to be Fu. I, I don't know. I'm going to say it has to be Dwayne. I don't see Fu going out and sampling Uncle Buck. I, I, that had to be Dwayne. Out of uh, context, it sounds so gnarly as in context. It's so silly. Before I realized what it was, I imagined it was from a uh, graphic gore movie. Yeah, you know, Dwayne had an incredibly good sense of humor. And I really think that that is definitely implied. Um, you know, what can you say? Um, when things work, they work. And in those days, you know, we went, kind of went ahead with our hunches. Penelope, uh, hey, could you please shed some light on the song Window Pan? From what I understand, it was a demo for Last Rites, complete with ogre vocals been floating around on the internet uh labeled as a demo version of bark it sounds like a sister's song to mirror saw you know that song has nothing to do with skinny puppy who's ever made that song you know and i have no idea who it is i'm thinking about um i'm thinking about it i'll listen to this uh link after i'm pretty sure that uh, we have gone in and said no that there has nothing to do with us so maybe someone sampled us and did some made a song but but uh, far as I know, that has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with Dwayne. It has nothing to do with Ogre. Hi, Kevin. I have the 2009 R uh, 45 RPM Rishio Blast Flights, like I just showed you. Were you involved in the release? And which vinyl do you believe to have the better sound? Um, 2009. Let's see. I wouldn't have been involved with that. Your network has done a huge disconnect with Skinny Puppy. It's something that um, I've tried to have them try to get to a better place with it with us you know there's no communication to us whatsoever um there's no disrespect and i try to tell people don't be disrespectful to network encourage network to be kinder to skinny puppy is the right thing to do we have a vibrant past we should be celebrating it and you know network should embrace their beginnings i've said this a number of times Network should be embracing their beginnings and do it with the band that they did it with. I think there's no better way about than let go of some of your stances on things, Rick, and let Terry sort of lead the way with his initiatives that he did with with Network, and basically let bygones be got bygones and step into the future. I mean, honestly, I can say the same thing to Rave, and I can say the same thing to Ken. It's disappointing not to just look back and just be you know, just fully respectful of everything that went on and everything uh, to go on into the future. So big, big up and big respect to everybody. Austin, hey, the King of Florida, what song stands out the most for you on this album? Or what's 
your favorite to play from this album and why? Love the King of Florida. Well, I, I just said that, you know, Love and Vain was like the track. And I wish that we continue playing that in the set. I'll do everything I can to try. If there's something, a problem with it, then, you know, it makes it more challenging. My thought is, is that it might be, it might be, you know, it could be that, you know, the, the style of vocal that is in the song is a little bit, you know, it could leave over in a place where maybe after performing that, who knows? You know, I know that there's some reason why we took it out of the set, but as I said, it's one of my favorite songs on the album and uh, uh, especially in the modern in incarnation of Skinny Puppy uh, was great to play. Uh, hope to see you, Austin. Circus in the Sky. I really believe Last Rites, I really believe Last Rites is, was the creative apex of the 80s, 90s, and electro-industrial, whatever we're calling it. Uh, nothing approached it uh, then or since. The darkness, uh, the chaos, the beauty, unbelievable. Gee, thank you. What can you say? You know, so for me, it's a marriage um, where we were all headed, like Noy Bouton, Test Department, how we were headed towards a world, even though it was based on electronics and crazy experimental, it actually did incorporate the playing of acoustic instruments. So that was a kind of an interesting take on it. And then also the world of, you know, drug abuse and touring such a such an odd show with crazy theatrics. I mean, I will say we possibly could have been the Alice Cooper of the 90s, you know, certainly greatly inspired by Alice Cooper as a kid. And uh, it's weird to see that we kind of like kind of moved in that direction, sort of like seemingly not so much on purpose, but it just went that way. Circus in the Sky unfortunately won't be free Sunday, but can someone please ask if there are any unused instrumental compositions from this period an album uh you know i believe that any sort of thing that would be around has been introduced here on the patreon i think there was maybe one outtake maybe from way way back we posted here which i think it was more from two dark park though when it was like a Dwayne song go go look into that Droid Harmony. Well, this is this is one many of us have been waiting for. Yeah, I know. I've been talking. So many people ask me about this. Uh, waiting for a Sergeant. There's Sergeant Pepper's Dark Side of the Moon and the Wall. Uh, for an electronic music geek who's just thought DM Violet was tops for the production in 91. I bought Last Rites when it came out. I had to rethink my criteria for albums that truly take you on a trip. Kevin, what are you? What's the motivation you had while assembling this, the, the wild ride of an album? Also, are there acoustic drum tracks that were recorded for most? Are there full acoustic drum tracks that were recorded for most of the songs? Yes, as I've said. I get the impression there's an incredible amount of recorded drumming that went unused. I don't think any other album I've heard uh, has the acoustic drums mashed to death, loops stuttered or distorted as those on Last Rites. Was Dave Ogilvy the main audio wizard responsible? Um, he was, and uh, also Ken. Ken and uh, Ray, bet between the two of them as engineers, were responsible for the drum sounds on the album. And, um, you know, it was a goal at the time to have always huge, monstrous drums that could be like ever, ever more effective in expressing like the point where the music is, is going. And with the free flowing nature of where Last Rites was headed, it seemed perfectly natural where the drums went. Uh, good one. Those acoustic drums and SP has always been a high point. C's a skilled percussionist. Yeah, I mean, thank you. So, you know, I did drum uh, in Doomsday and really feel um, accomplished in the sense of what that show is about. And then as well, I drummed on Ogre's 2001 tour, and that was the last time uh, with Drumasaurus that I actually toured. And my thought was either I'm going to wholly commit wholeheartedly 100% to the world of the Drumasaurus and the world what that was. But that means that whoever's on the keyboard end of it um, playing Skinny Puppy has to have the, the head wrapped around the ideology of what's entailed for that. 
And because I wasn't just the drummer of Skinny Puppy, but also a composer, um, at this point I had to step forward and say, I have to take on the responsibility and hand over possibly my responsibility to someone uh, that, I mean, I think Justin does a fantastic job of fulfilling that role. I mean, I think maybe the only thing about Justin is that I used to hit the drums, I think about, I used to hit the drums a lot harder. And I don't think that necessarily that makes it better, but I just know that there was a significant amount of impact that our shows had that I've kind of like tried to want to suggest to Justin, hey, stand up at this point or fucking just throw that drum across the room or, you know, something uh, like some brutality. Um, and the thing is, is that just, Justin's precision is what makes him Justin though. And I think that, you know, out of all the drummers I've worked with, Justin's like, you know, one of the top drummers I've ever, I've ever heard. You, you got to hear him warm up backstage to really understand you know, the, the complexity of Justin and how, how amazing he truly is. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. I stopped drumming when Justin came along. Uh, I Wraith, this dark lyrical content of Last Rites is well documented as a sort of a real time chronicle of Ogre's downward spiral during this time. Uh, what doesn't get mentioned often is the fact that the music behind is also extremely dark and highly abrasive. If I may ask, were you and Dwayne where were you and Dwayne at mentally and emotionally during this time? And what impact did it have on the sound of the record? As I said uh, earlier, um, I was already making a disconnect because of the intensity of the tours. Like, you know, I mean, there were moments when if you had somebody getting angry at somebody on in the crew, but then would take a mic and start screaming it through the PA. I mean, if that was enough to shatter my nerves. And so basically once this sort of like dynamic started happening where the, you know, became like, it just became so challenging to deal with it that I found that the solace that I took away was what was quite important phase of my life. I'll never forget the first time that I ever heard the master of last rites, I was in Florida at my girlfriend's house and we were there the parents had gone away and left us in this house. It was dark and we listened to it outside. We were sort of like in this area outside by the pool. And it was like this very unusual setting. And I remember that the album scared the shit out of me. Like, honestly, it, it was really the first time I heard download. And, I mean, the first time I heard, it, I heard it with, with, with left hand shake and everything. I just thought like, I, I mean, it really scared. It really scared me. And so I thought that that's, that's a unique response. Um, you know, I don't know which, which way I'd put it, the, you know, my response on it was like, it's as unsettling as the way that I felt at the time. But to come and do the Last Rites tour was as challenging as the idea. Um, you know, there were so many challenges again with the people and the cast. And that's largely why after Last Rites, you know, why Basically, you know, there was a sort of level of separation and a level of, you know, which way are we going to go? Which way is going to head it? I didn't even think that Last Rise would actually get made, to be quite honest, let alone the process. So, you know, cons I consider it just an achievement that an album even got made at this point, considering sort of like the disassociation between the, you know, Dwayne and Mai's relationship with Ogre. So yeah, it's just a document of the separation, really. Uh, Kevin, could you could an internet funding help pay for the rights to Timothy Leary's voice? I don't know if it could or not. Uh, Joey, is there any piece of gear, synthesizer, drum machines that was were used consistently on the album? Well, I think I've sort of said that I think the SY twenty two makes a very uh, sorry SY seventy seven makes a very uh, significant presence on the album as far as like the the tonalities of some of the sections of uh circus stance mirror saw and um and download for that matter uh kevin once said that the sequential circuits per one was used in some way on every scp track it's possible that it did previously but on this album it only got used on inquisition from what i can remember 
as well as the ending of download as played by the legendary Martin Declare. You want to know what a Pro One sounds like as a synthesizer? The end of download is simply just a Pro One through a tape echo. And if the resonance is right on your Pro One, that's what it should sound like. What's the story behind the abandoned Love and Vain single? Um, you know, good question. I just don't think that it got enough support at that time. I can't actually give it a reason as to why. Certainly the album did fairly well. Um, Capitol Records wanted to resign us. And, you know, in some ways I really wish that, as I say, I wish we hadn't changed a thing about our formula. Um, I think that absolutely we've obviously achieved a formula at this point. And I think the worst idea in the world was for Rick Rubin and the guys to come along and say, oh, you need to work with Adrian Sherwood and Brian Eno, and you need to do this, and you need to do this, and we don't think Rave is a million selling producer, you need to have him just be standing aside. And when I told Rave that, he said, he just totally got infuriated with me, and I'm sure that's the reason that Rave hasn't spoken to me in 27 years. Even though we did get back together and finish the process, and I thought everything was fine, uh, we still haven't spoken in 27 years, so that's just how it is. Larry Clanky, to me, this is the album that is the spiritual successor to Vivisect. Was it a conscious decision to have basically two separate parts uh, to this release? No, I see it as two acts, side one and side two. Side one having all the vocals and side two being basically experimental. Well, it wasn't made with that in mind. I also remember reading an interview where he described Mirasaws and the quintessential Dwayne moment. Yes, I have said that again in this uh, in this chat. Uh, any other Dwayne moments? Uh, yes, as I've said, uh, download is very significant as well as circumstance. And something I've always wanted to know, what does the chord stab type sound in Inquisition? Um, it was a sample on my Emacs. Again, just a sample that sounded good as a chord. And later I found out that it is actually in a note. So I was able to utilize that. A lot of people have described this as the White Album of Industrial, and I have to agree with that. Well, it's 100% better. Well, the White Album was considered a pretty head of its time album with George Martin and the production uh, levels attained. So I'll take that as a huge compliment. Thank you very much for your question. Larry, I see Larry have come up with some questions. Crap, one more. If you haven't had already by this time, please go into La Humanate. Um, you know, as I said, this song is probably the most drug drenched song of the album. Uh, coming from Ogre's perspective, I've heard him um, express it as a, a moment where, yeah, he almost OD'd when he was laying down the vocal. Um, it was too intense for any of us to be around, so we were not there. Uh, musically, we left it at, you know, this was something I guess we were going to present to La 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 Human Steps, and then it became an idea that, wait, this song is. It's nice, it, you know. Let's 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 work on this. So, it was an after after we worked on it last. I remember, it was the very last song that we worked on. Andrew Waterloo, my first puppy album, bought a used copy in 1994 and listened to it on repeat. I knew it was an album that needed a little more time to to bake in. I like that word. Uh, due to a recent high volume listen, returning home from LPD in Toronto. Uh, last November, I found a new love for the last half of the album, especially Circus Dance. It is sweet perfection. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it takes a while to, to understand that song, but once you do, it just says it's it's a Dwayne world that only Dwayne could come up with. I challenge anybody to try and come up with a song as complex as that. Um, as I said, performing that song gave me goosebumps. I so look forward to this one. Thank you. Big questions. Uh, Last Rites sounds as if there's a narrative concept to the record and where the compositions, sample choices and album floor deliberately intertwine with Ogre's lyrics and performance. Is there such an aspect and how did it come together given Ogre and Ray worked on vocals and separation? Yeah, as you, you, you nailed it. There was, there was a response to musical uh, statements and it was directly responded to. And uh, I think that that's you know what what makes the connect on the album, but also uh, the discordance of it all. Uh, Last Rites is the most sonically dense SP record in early '90s product 
production at Landmark How did you achieve such complexity in layering, sequencing, and sample warping with the technology at the time? Any standout gear and production methods? Well, you know, the team. I have to say that the team, without everybody in the team, and, you know, obviously, um, everybody had their job. Um, I think that there was a great amount of time put into the mix uh, on an SSL console mixing last rights. If you can imagine an SSO, the ability you have to sort of like sculpt in the EQ on everything like that is like, you know, Rave did an amazing job on the mixing. And uh, that's that's a testament to it. Uh, nowhere uh, has such an over the top heavy layering that it comes uh, across as basically impossible to mix. Uh, how did you tackle mixing in the rest and the rest of Last Rites, given it's such a challenging now raw, uh, novel record with hardly any mix references. You know, Nowhere is a song that basically, as I said, it's it, it's audio sculpturing. And I remember that we we're all sitting there when uh, those songs, a lot of us would be sitting there panning or a lot of us would be sitting there with effects sounds and, and um, you know, just making sure that everyone had their own department when it came to that mix and finally laying it down. And, um, you know, Nowhere is like a success story of a song that there shouldn't be a, su a success story to. And I, I, I challenged, I've challenged myself to make it again. I've also challenged myself to try and play it again. No go. What was the creative uh, process intent behind the extensive freeform experimental collages and sounds in the second half. Well, as I said, it just got more um, like, as I said, Dwayne took took on a bigger role, and we start having songs like uh, "Download" and "Circus Stance" and "Mirror Saw" and things coming into it that had such a definitive personality at the time. We had never even heard this anything like this before. It was the same for us as listeners, as makers. So we were responding to anything that came along, and I'm, I'm hopeful that they, you know, did the same. You know, when I brought along Killing Game or I brought along, you know, Lust Chance or any of these songs, I think there was a perfect marriage behind like how I didn't see the shape of where Skinny Puppy was headed as being like the same as I did in the past anymore, and so it, it was morphing into something new, and held if I knew where it was going. Uh, is it true that Ogre wanted to record more vocals, but his mental and physical state time along with personal conflicts made it impossible? I don't really know the answer to that. I do know that he has made a statement that he left uh, sessions and went into uh, detox. So um, I know it was a, <laughs> a, a really intense period. There's this urban legend of Ogre having a seizure while recording, and that was, and was left in the mix. Um, I've heard... I heard that could be true, and I heard it was in La Um If I'm wrong, I'm just also going by information what I've heard. Matthew 242, Kevin Last Rites is my favorite album all time. Thus, this and Bill and Reese's Technical Neural Implant released the same year. To me, the pinnacle of modern electronic music, Last Rites, seems to bring out the most visceral and honest emotions from its listeners. What I've always found fascinating about Last, last Rites is that the artists have always shown via music or film or, or how low a person can sink, but they always demonstrate that you can rise up and escape, excuse me, I got a hiccup, and through, uh, and through the light at the end of the tunnel. Last Rites does not do this. It holds you underwater for the duration of the album all the way through the flat line, single tone that closes out download. It's haunting, beautiful, creative, cathartic. Thank you for this album. Question, please talk about the human name. Yeah, it's, it's something that we have been discussing here. I hope you've got your feeling about that. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to have make an album some 31 years ago. And it's another thing to have an album 31 years later, still sort of like sound okay. And that to me is like, sort of the biggest testament that the, uh, the, the, the aging of it is is something that I really appreciate, but also the fact that I know that I can never go and do it again. Well, specifically without the, all the people involved, you know, uh, Dwayne and you know the essence of 
like his spirit um, and the collaborative and then sort of like the headbutting of, you know, the whole rest of the team, you know, really made for what it is. And so it, it comes out in the album. Alex, for me, I think Two Dark Park and Last Hearts are the records where I think the music transcends all the peers in a way that is just absurd. Were you guys influenced by any other acts at the time? Seems uh, to be devoid of any obvious external influences. I know you mentioned an interest in the doors. And I remember uh, seeing a clip of Ogre saying that someone told him, wasn't that, he told him that he wasn't Jim Morrison, the band's like that <laughs> more of an influence uh, than portion control. You know, it's so funny that you should say that because right at the very beginning of the last right sessions, um, our manager um, surprised me because I was going through this Doors era. I remember I told you that, you know, I'd moved to Florida on and off. And when I was moved to Florida, for some reason, I'd taken this giant interest in, in the Doors after Edward Caspell had said to me, have you ever watched the Doors live at Hollywood Bowl? And I said, no, I hadn't. He said, listen to it on stereo speakers. And he says, and remember that Jim was peaking on three hits of acid. And so I watched it and I thought like, wow, you know, I thought, after what I had just been through, I thought like, wow, is there some common ground here between the story of like what they were going through as a band and what I felt, I felt some sort of, sort of like common ground. So I started reading books on, you know, the experiences and I read uh, No One Here Gets Out Alive and stuff like that. And I started thinking, you know, getting a keener interest in the doors. And I really didn't really have that much of an interest in the music before that, but um, our manager set it up so that um that night at, after the rehearsal i was taken to meet ray manzarek and i'm here with a door t-shirt on and a headband and uh this is because i come directly from rehearsal believe it or not i was, can't believe i was wearing a door shirt too and uh he was with michael mcclure and michael mcclure was uh, actually um one of jim morrison's biggest uh, inspirations uh, for a lyricist, he was like the, one of the original beat poets. And uh, so here I was like, uh, kind of like, you know, getting mind blown. I thought like, God, oh, here's some weird synchronicity between the doors and, and, and my life. I felt like, you know, what's going to happen next? And, you know, as we went on with the Last Rites tour, I was like, kind of seeing that, you know, this is going to be something that I'm going to have to survive. You know, I was kind of like happy to see that, you know, the last show of Skinny Puppy with Dwayne was at the Metro. And it's kind of like that one of those special places where you think like, you know, um, you know, what a better place could there be uh, for a band to like, sort of like do their last show um, as far as like that, that whole lineup and everything. We went to Hawaii and then somehow I don't even know how they did how they fly all of our equipment to Chicago, but yeah, so they're flying our equipment to Chicago and, uh, and we did our last show there and it was, it was something that at the time, you know, I never really thought um, that was going to be the last show with Dwayne and it just kind of occurred to me that, you know, that was going to be the last show. I mean, there was like even, I have this poster here, Skinny Puppy and Godflesh. Is going to be in Prague on Sunday, August. Oh, you see it. It's a big poster I have here, frame. And uh, Skinny Puppy Godflesh gig that never happened. Uh, the Skinny Puppy tour, uh, at the end of it, uh, Ogre had hurt his leg. But I also think that possibly maybe he was uh, going to go back into some rehab, and uh, that prevented us from following up the Last Rites tour to Europe. And then I seriously thought for sure, you know, that the band was gonna be done there at that point, for sure. Um, after what we'd been through and everything, I didn't know how it'd be possible, but both Dwayne and I continued on um, writing demos. And basically, uh, as you know, we went on to make another album. Do you remember who came up with the album title? Um, I don't. Was there some awareness that the band was possibly uh, being read its last rites? Oh, absolutely. I know you mentioned in an earlier chat, 
1985, that 1985 is one of your last good hangs with Ogre. Had things reached a toxic state? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, um, it, it, you know, you know, for lack of any better terminology, I mean, like, we had a good thing and we both knew it, but we had a horrible personal relation. And so I, you know, had a really rough time dealing with like um, any sort of like, well, I guess there was a lot in those days, there was a lot of things that was like, you know, we didn't have the internet or we didn't have things. So basically everything was always behind the scenes. So maybe we heard too much about what was being said or maybe something, I don't know what happened, but in whatever case, it just seemingly got to a very toxic place. And it was really unfortunate because it didn't really have to have to go there, but it did. It just naturally went there from something that nobody would plan, which is the nature of like how it went. I think the lyrics and vocal production of Laughter Rights are perhaps the most clouded and indecipherable. I remember finding, finding out outrageously concocted attempts to suss out the words on the internet 90s, lots of question marks and areas uh, did you or Dwayne ever want to know more about the content of the lyrics? It was just a no fly zone. It's a no fly zone. Um, they're personal. And sometimes if I want, you know, even if I have the lyrics seen in front of me, I still can't really understand sometimes the true intent or meaning of skinny puppy songs. So I really love the ogre style of lyrical writing though. So I'll leave it at that. It's like um, a form of expressionism that has always gone well with the music and plus I think Ogre has been you know one of the most unique vo vocal writers as lyric writers um, that I've heard. Um, I'll leave it at that. Coming off of Two Dark Park, was there a new approach to build on that record? Yeah, I think I've kind of alluded to how uh, the Two Dark Park tour kind of brought on the new level. How close on personal level were you and Dwayne during that record? Uh, we were still fine. Actually, Dwayne and I didn't really have any substantial fallings, fallings out until there was one period um, just pre the process when Dwayne was going through some hard times. Well, you know, he's kind of like took off into his own individual space when he was doing a lot of the chemicals and stuff like that. I think chemical drugs always brings on a form of separation, but um when Dwayne and I went to do the process we actually had a re a rebonding luckily and by the time that Dwayne and I finished it was you know we we'd gone through a lot together but we ended up uh being you know together up until the end I mean basically uh I, I was the one that drove him to the bus depot to his final destination so, you know, it's not a story I like to even think about how that all turned out. It's a, it's a tragic story, absolute tragedy. And uh, I would do anything to have changed it, but some things were on course to things that, you know, no one could change. Thanks for the questions. I've always I've been curious as to why this is the only SP record to not include the printed lyrics. So that's pretty much why. Even in 92, as an eight year old, just kind of assumed mental state. I think it's it's been widely sort of said that you know ogre didn't um want to uh release the lyrics on more of a personal level if it's true that phase cancellation will bring uh the lyrics more clearly um someone could possibly dictate it and uh write them down lars about downloads absolutely magic it's the best ambient piece of music ever made in my book uh, i think i've gone through that here um yeah, the pro one at the end and so on. Uh, it's not the Prophet 5, the pro one. From what I remember, this is the track that Martin de Clear played on, and that is correct. I think the Inquisition bass line is very similar to the one in Prentu Hughes Headhunter. Um, inspirationally, it's a, it's a bass line that stays in one key. Um, so I think that was kind of, again, the basis of rhythmic inspiration. I like Front Two for Two. We were good friends with Richard Twenty Three, and you know, I didn't have anything against it. I tried to always not to borrow from my friends, though. Uh, though I have said earlier that I do believe that in assimilate. I ripped off uh, 
Edward's uh, love in a plain brown envelope, not knowingly, but later I told Edward, I think I ripped you off. Anyways, so be it. We're all buddies. Aaron, Last Rites is a masterpiece. I first listened to this on cassette and and when it was released, uh, when the album launched, the tracks on the album uh, weren't divisioned correctly. That's correct. Silence for 39 seconds at the end of track one and 39 seconds, blah, blah, blah. The issue was corrected and I wondered what the original issue was. Well, do you ever notice that Skinny Puppy records always seemingly got plagued by some sort of problem? I always thought that maybe it was possible that somebody was intentionally fucking with us. I thought like maybe rabies got put Dolby on it. You know, the original version or, you know, like this version with all the messed up times. I've even seen where, you know, we've got like versions of our albums released with other person's recordings on it. Or I can't remember exactly which one it was. But it was like somebody else's record. Bon Jovi, maybe? I think people out there have a, you know, there was a sense of humor back in those days. R.M. Cox, there are so few albums that are an interesting listen. And this is at the top of that. A young man with a head full of acid roaming through a field full of fog and discovering this album for the first time. It's not just a fond memory, but a gateway to an unimaginable world of experience. I can't put it lightly. The only question would be about the tone of the album and the change leading into the process. How did the overall vibe come about? And was it intentional part of a progression of the band or was it a byproduct of the atmosphere? It was a byproduct of the atmosphere. It was absolutely natural. And it was, I guess if we were conveying our feelings and our true emotions, it was truly what we were feeling. I mean, I've described the disconnect. I've described the feeling to want to be in a better place. I've described the feeling about wanting things to be. But unfortunately, you know, things were very intense. Uh, thanks for the question. Craig Maloney, I was at one of the, I was one of the first folks to pick up the CD re release. And as a result, got the version with the tracking that was off by a minute. Who at Network Capital were asleep at the wheel? I don't know, man. Funnily enough, this also happened with MC900 for Jesus. I mean, who knows? Maybe those guys at Network could know the bottom of the story. Shannon, very happy about this chat. My question is, how did you get away with sampling the Beatles on Love and Vain? Hey, maybe it is true that we sampled them. As I said, I thought possibly we had done a sample of something else that sounds like it. But if it isn't, then truly it is, you are correct. How could we have? And so back in the day, I used to always, because we didn't, at the time, you didn't have somebody talking about sample clearance. You didn't have people talking about samples or them being illegal. So we, people just went ahead and did. And it wasn't up until the time when somebody said, hey, wait, that someone realized that, you know, on Capitol Records, there was like Warner Brothers, recordings being sampled i mean this is just this funny thing but you know to this day i think what's what i really respect about it is that everyone's just let it be there's no no one that's gone back and said hey this has to go away it's like no it exists and there it is and so uh i guess we have to be happy with you know it's like a sign of the times that shows you that wow people did sample the beatles and get away with it at one point and it's not that we got away with it it's just that it worked on the song Possibly if it is. And um, nobody, nobody said anything. As a matter of fact, I met Sean Lennon one time and he was really cool. And he was playing a guitar I actually ended up buying. And I, I came back later to pick it up and the salesman said, hey, while you were here with Sean Lennon, did you know that he was tripping on mescaline? And I said, no. And so it's just sometimes you have these connections with people that you know you don't know but might be deeper and so maybe that's my closest to my beetle connection there uh i mean i heard that revolution nine was made by john and yoko so big up to uh to uh to that song revolution nine as being one of the greatest pieces of music concrete ever made uh yes finally jordan thank you jacob you seem like a happy, positive guy these days, based on what I see in these chats. Does it feel like a different person made a dark record? Or are you able to get back to that headspace immediately? Is it ever difficult to listen to? No, I like listening to it. Um, I've always been a positive person deep down inside. I've gone through depression. I've gone through 
musical uh, cacophony as far as like being in a place where the music that we're making is cacophonous and how to respond to that. Um, I just tried my best to make music that I thought was true to what I s set out to do. And like see, every single time I've ever made a song for Skinny Pepe, I always thought like, is this true to what I set out to do? And if I can say yes, then, you know, that's what it is. Um, thanks for that question. Um, it's, it's, it's an honest question. Jonathan Glass, is there a piece of gear used on Last Rites that you wish you still had? Well, I guess maybe the SY-77, though I have a TG-77. I remember there was something weird about the SY that um, felt compelled to get rid of it at one point and then regretted it later. I have Dwayne Sounds, but it's not something that I go back and delve into. I consider that Dwayne's world and have left it at that. Um, as far as anything else is concerned, I still have pretty much everything else. Uh, so also sold the Prophet 5. I'm not too sure if it ever got used that much on the album, though, more so in the live show. Never sell old synths. I'm just, that, I've learned that lesson. If they're anything significant, that is. Um, Brad Bell, the whole album is so great. It makes me think you and Dwayne were capable of doing anything. It was really funny at the time, Dwayne and I did feel like, you know, after making Doubting Thomas and then coming into uh, Two Dark Park and Lost Rights, I knew that, you know, we were building up and honing in on this strength that I didn't know where it was going to lead. And so that was what kept us going and kept us excited is nobody could tell us at that time where, what would happen next. Um, download is such a, a flex to to wrap with it uh, to wrap with it it always felt to me like an update of uh, beatles revolution i know we've been talking about that like taking up where they left off i didn't even realize until releasing the whole album starts off with a sample uh you know i guess i guess i guess it must be a sample of the album even though i was confused there i mean it's been long ago that i can't physically remember but it is possible we all know that Rivers End is a descendant of Rivers. Is it just me, or does that, or does the Inquisition uh, have a lot of texture in it? Um, no, there's nothing in that. It was re uh, completely rewritten. Whose idea was the glitch skipping CD on Less Chance? You know, I have to say that has to be Foo. This that sample didn't come from me, and the LG seventy three and the creative stuff that Foo was adding. It wouldn't surprise me that something of that nature came from him. You know, Anthony's a very, very capable guy, very quiet guy. Um, love to have him on a chat, but I think he's just far too shy and quiet to come on. But maybe I can have him on one day and he can, he can explain that element. His idea, oh, Nine Inches uh, Remix EP Fixed came out the same year and uh, Jim Thur Thurwell, Use basically all the same Timothy Leary samples as track 10. Was that just a random coincidence? Gee, I didn't even know that. You know that? And Timothy never said anything to me about that or to us about that. Uh, possibly, maybe he just was. I mean, you could tell by the tone of Timothy's letter that it was like adamant that it should be utilized. I mean, he, he felt it's his work. So it wasn't, you know, I think like when publishers start to say they own you and no, 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 that basically it can make you get offended. Uh, Alex, as so many uh, above have noted, the Uncle Buck sample is just a unique surprise. Wondered if you and Dwayne ever saw John Hughes other films like The Breakfast Club, of course, Ferris Bueller, yes, 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 yes. Yes, of course, we're, we're always watching movies. Uh, less more so lately though, I must say. Russ uh, Burdick, so many great questions. Yes, some fantastic questions today, guys. Uh, I already have none left such a great album it really uh, felt like an end of an era and how different the process was did it feel that way to you did you think that you'd keep going as usual or some, see some end in sight um you know i think like you can never at this point when you're making music like this you can never even see what is the end you know if it wasn't for the death of Dwayne or this whole thing i my thought is is that we would still be going like as far as Dwayne and 
our Dwayne and Maya's creation would have to keep going because I think there was just as much. Um, we both shared, wow, where is this going? Equally as much, and we often talked about it. And so there was never any question. I mean, you know, Dwayne and I were, when we formed Download, basically with Mark and Phil, we were ecstatic about the idea that, you know, we were going to continue with the concept of where kind of last rights had headed, especially the, the song Download. That's why the band Download uh, became with that name, because because of that inspiration, how we wanted to take it into that uncharted territory again. Hey, James. Uh, hey, Kevin. This this along with Two Dark Box is my favorite of your work. So very excited to hear about this. I think it's hands down masterpiece. And for me, it's never lost a single bit of its terrifying magic since I first listened to it. Uh, one, you probably mentioned this in your chat. However, this was the album in which uh, Dwayne used the notorious SY22. I believe it was more first the SY77, it was later we got the SY22 for the process. What are the specific that? Yeah, what are the specific tracks and sounds that's used for? I think I've gone into detail here about that. Such a unique and a new, unique sounding synth. Never been able to locate it in the album. Well, as I said, uh, mirror saw, uh, circus stance, um, just 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 all over um, the album. Um, the complexity of anything that doesn't sound analog is either a noise sample or it's that damn SY-22. You know, Dwayne became an expert on the K-2000. I really, I want to say that at a certain point, I really want to think that the K-2000 could have been there. Dwayne became absolutely masterful on that. Combination between the K-2000 and the K and the SY-77 was absolutely Dwayne's uh, arsenal. He, he didn't need anything else, even though he loved the mini Moog. Uh, I've read quite a bit about the intense period the band and particularly Ogre was going through during the making of the album. Given this, in combination with the extreme subject matter and sound textures of the album, did you ever feel an anxiety about releasing such an extreme work? I had, I had anxiety in general altogether. Didn't need to feel that about the music. Um, I always was depressed and always always had anxiety, and I felt that musical music was a cure. So, you know, having the connection, having a great partner, having a great team was always like a great thing. We, we supported each other and basically um, that's where our solace was. Were the effects on Ogre's voice the same on previous albums or was it something different? I think there was more distortion brought in on these, uh, on uh, Last Rites and uh, as Rave and Ogre worked um, more closely and privately on this album, I think there was a greater connect between um, the whole connection between Rave and Ogre. So that yeah, was a very successful connect. Brian Conley was, uh, there's some thought that Last Rites may be the final Skinny Puppy album. Yes. Yes and yes on Last Rites. Jacob Scriber, having been too young to see any of the previous tours, I was over the moon uh, when the Last Rites tour came to Copenhagen, only to be canceled within a few weeks. Uh, little did we know that it would take another eight years before I finally get to see Skinny Puppy at Doomsday. My question is, was the reason? What was the reason for this cancellation? Yeah, it was basically uh, injuries and uh, injuries, illness, and drug addiction has gotten into. I'm so sorry about that. Scrapped. This was my second Skinny Puppy album. Right after hearing Rabies a few weeks before, I find it funny that it started with what many would consider a more accessible release and then the next exposure is one of the most challenging releases from you guys it took me a, a while to fully understand what was happening with the music i was hearing and once i understood i was hooked great work and thanks for the wonderful sound for all the years thank you yeah i know i mean i don't consider it an easy album for anybody to get into christopher john i don't even know what to say about this album it changed everything for me and Literally changed my life in high school with the early 90s. Kevin, I was always meant to tell you when I was still in LA, but I was really wanted to spare you the fanboy. First of all, would there be any more surviving demos? No, I think you said no on that. Also, uh, there are so many great live raps from that tour. Um, there are recordings of that, believe it or not. And so I guess in that sense, there are those recordings. I actually possess a box of live recordings from the live Last Rites tour. I have not gone through them. 
Finally, I am less in the synth spotting than I was when I was younger, but what is playing the funky bass line on Love and Vain? Emacs, Emacs samples. You know, no, no, no analog synth on that one. Uh, Jeremy, it took me years for this album to finally uh, click. But once it did, I realized this, this is no mirror album. This is a doorway to another world. My two questions, since it looks like everyone converted all the technical stuff is more art related. Did Jim hear the album before creating the album? Uh, no, he did not. I asked because something about the cover just seems to be perfectly represent the nightmarish disjointed wasteland so well. I agree. Uh, one more question about the composition. Do you, you guys really tossed out whatever rules there may have been? What inspired these compositions and arrangements? Hopefully I've touched on that in the course of this chat. Uh, there's so much more abstract insanity and sound sculpture going on here than ever before and somehow it all just works you know sampling was new and what it led to was ideas that were taking on you know shapes and, and dimensions instead of just sounds and melodies and that was you know Les rights was a monster and there was a part of carving out that monster that basically came as a part of experiencing each track by track acid it's my favorite skinny puppy album by far i was already a fan but this record and the supporting tour made by skinny puppy my favorite uh i'm glad to see you on drums the the track timing issues on the cd forced me to listen to the whole thing start to finish which i continue to do so after i bought the quality controlled sp uh love and vein still holds my attention because it took so long before i finally got to hear the beginning favorite track nowhere was there a particular bit of insp inspiration or gear that really helped put this over the uh, top? I felt like last right hits an apex and no, nothing ever will. Well, sampling, as I just said, and as well, um, for me, it was, you know, the acquisition of the uh, Emacs 2. The Emacs 2 was just like a doorway into, you know, non-conventionality as far as like, you, you know, if I sampled a bass and it had a bit of like TV in it, then there could be that nuance that made it that unique sound. And uh, that's what I would go for. I'd just sit there. As I said, we've always tried to misuse the equipment somehow. So try to get something unique by something that's broken. Uh, S. Poison, longtime fan here. What, uh, what a long, strange trip. Uh, tell me about it. Which synth was used to make the uh, flatline drone? Okay, we said that's the pro one. Was that Dwayne? No, it's more time to clear. Uh, pure genius like the rest of the album. You know, Martin Declare, man, the guy was uh, absolutely tuned in. And I loved working with him on the Tear Garden. Uh, he's on The Last Man to Fly. He's also on uh, Crystal Mass. He's also even on the last album. Go check it out. Eve Tenebrae, no questions. I just wrote a long thing and then realized I actually don't have any questions, at least not, I hadn't been already asked. By the way, uh, weren't any of my damn... Okay, uh, I've said enough other elsewhere, I think. How much I love Last Rites. Okay, you love Last Rites. Thank you, Eve. Thank you. Mark 13, I always tell people this album is a masterpiece from beginning to end, a complete masterpiece. I vaguely re remember you saying that you wrote Killing Game in a short amount of time. It was in one day and lost in one day and then and then rewritten again after breakdown in one day. You need to bring it back. What? Killing game. <laughs> yeah, we played it in the set last uh, last tour, 2017, and uh, I found it to be the most challenging song we have to play. So I always thank myself when I say, "Great, you wrote a song that you know you don't just naturally step up and play." So again, it's it's probably I don't know about the future of Killing Game. But uh, we'll see. Um, let's see here. Uh, can you elaborate? Also, I've talked about Nowhere and Uranus Cancelled, how it's like, like a breakdown of Mirror Song. Griffin, on personal re-listens, do you, do you include Handshake as, as track 10? Well, I think it's important to have track 10 as an essential part of the listen because it's a part of the story. If you hear it between circus dance and download, it will make a little more sense to you. Also at the end of download, there's a very long atmospheric part. 
if you play last rites and the last man to fly back to back the two albums end and begin with very similar screeching sound well it's funny as we're talking about martin de claire as part of the tear garden justin grignon was the bass synth at the end of circus sound uh, uh an allusion to black sabbath sweet leaf or buttholes butthole surfers sweet loaf my favorite uh, skinny puppy moment you know it wasn't specifically, but I saw it as a definite metal moment. Like those chords, it was like I I heard them the first time and I said, I'm stop the break here and then coming in big on like the, you know, on those. It was, it just felt anthemic. Uh, I love that part. This album gave me, gave the music so beautiful, strange and macabre to help survive the trauma and abuse. I wasn't old enough to know I had if music this interesting never got made, uh, I would have been too bored to live. Thank you. Oh, that's a cool thing to say. Thanks, Justin. Zach, what synth were you using for strings, which starts at the bridge to Love and Vain and continue all the way to the end of the song? Um, Believe it or not, I would, I would always go back and see that whenever I would compose something with strings, it was always the ESQ. I would always use the... Um, there was a factory string sound on the Mirage that it was called like classical strings that I'd always use over the choral string dimension of that. And quite often I would use those too. But if you soak it with delay or you soak it with you know some effects, it basically take on a whole a whole new world. And you know, a little bit of flange, a little bit of effects, and uh, you know, you come up with something there. I I, I quite often always like to return to similar string sounds as you might see in songs. And they're based upon just loving strings. I mean, always loves, always loves strings. Um, uh, how did you achieve the sounds at the beginning of Mirror Cell? That's Dwayne. And are those live drums? Yes, they are all the drumosaurus, acoustic drums, not electronic drums. Uh, Ras Mix, on Inquisition, how did you get those vocal sounding drum samples? Was that radio or your own voice? Yeah, there was a lot of radio samples. And as I said, the bass sound, I kind of like want to say it had noise in it as well. So there, there was like glitchy, you know, glitchy samples on it. And thanks to the old 44 megabyte side quests, um, the mystery shall remain that that sample is on this right as we speak. And kind of pisses me off. Oh, I'd see it on the back here angst there it is angst written yeah so i'll find a way anyone got a 44 megabyte side quest cartridge drive out there uh does lush chance sample inquisition oh uh, no exit i heard this album when it was brand new and hated it nowhere was just a wall of noise lush chance and an obnoxious break with with tight trilling loops and download was just a sampler fell down the stairs it was so far from remission and mine that I was just was a waste and re refused it but of course like many few things in life I went back it only took my only uh, only to look past my initial reaction and soon it became my favorite album the whole tight trilling loop I'd even emulate in one of my own early works composed on the Commodore 64 Suddenly I heard layers upon layers in nowhere that I hadn't noticed before. Yeah, it's deep with layers in there. Each listen gave me more. Download was a masterpiece. Try and make a song like Download. I challenge any one of you. And then in the middle, uh, tracks it shined. I would roam into the hours of the night lonely and despondent with this tape in my Walkman. Something incredible happened as if a door opened that shouldn't have been there. And I, there I, I could hear the source tracks. It turned out all my earphones had a short in the cable, which caused phase cancellation, causing the drums to disappear. Entire instruments were soloed or hidden. I heard what was the meaning. What, uh, I heard what wasn't heard, what meant to be heard. When I realized what had happened, I began converting each track on my Amiga to sides. When I heard Ogre saying, we all have to be addicted to one thing or another as clear as, the day, as, clear as day at the end of Scrapyard. How the John Candy Uncle Buck sample, by the way, I heard clean drums in place of pulsing drums and killing game. I wanted to share this with you all years later, but would learn that phase cancellation was no mystery and that sides and mids are common in 
and mixing mastering. Anyways, this album has been a favorite for all these years and still remains. Uh, you know, that's a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, phase cancellation does provide for some very interesting uh, listens on things. Uh, I personally, yeah, I don't know where to go listen to that. Maybe that's posted online. Uh, Sebastian, hi Kevin, my first uh, Skinny Puppy album and all-time fave. In a post you shared in Last Rites Jam, refused by Ogre for being too techno, which upset Dwayne. Can you talk more about this? Yes, there was, uh, maybe that was from Last Rites then that we posted earlier. There was a song. No, I believe that was from Too Dark Park. Um, as songs, um, as we got further into the history, um, as I mentioned to this earlier, uh, Ogre became opposed to songs that were headed in a, um, at the time, um, the, the rave techno, rave techno sort of direction and didn't want to head that way and wanted to keep it dirty and um, dirty. So there was a headbutt there between Dwayne and Ogre eventually, uh, which more, more notably would come on the next album. What was going on in y'all's head, Dwayne and you, as you develop this sonic uh, palette? It's such a logical climb from previous, but gigantic step as far as a timber and expression. There's so much soul in this record. Um, I think that basically what you're tuning into is the human element becoming more, more integrated. Uh, you know, if you listen to Last Rites or Too Dark Park, Too Dark Park is very much a programmed album um, with a lot less live playing and some more sequence stuff. And I think once you start getting into the physicality of things being played and bashed and hit and, and so on, it's like also the, the state of where the songs take you, like those songs are far from normal, but like the, you know, the, the integration by all parties takes it to a place that is a giant question mark in the sky. Well, what is this and how do I decipher it? I mean, it's an international question. I think it still goes on today. So I think uh, that's possibly why people are still interested in the album. Chris Va Vaughn, if we could, um, if we could just get left hand shake, it's, it's due justice on the album. It would be like the gates have been lifted for house to have that lost that pivotal key. I remember plugging uh, into it, a ripped version and felt like a puzzle yeah, had been solved. Yeah, we, I think we've gone over that as to how it's an integral part of the, uh, whole thing. Holy smokes. Fraser, I've been watching some of the Last Rites live stuff, really become fascinated with a very, f very few live vids. I think visually and sonically, it's some of the most intense material ever made. The beautiful FM, uh, SY77 choirs and whistles along with the messed up flange Prophet 5, failing bells give the brat moments and interludes a really striking alien weirdness. I agree. And I'm particularly interested in the video collage on the small screen under Dwayne's rig. It's, it's scarily good video installation. It's so effective and unsettling. Where did that idea come from? Dwayne just wanted to have a source of material of all sorts of like um, video that he could also have audio. So there's audio components that he's utilized from that too. And um, so a large part of that is just a collage element. And then I've also utilized that same tape um, in a lot of the videos, um, sampling that from that um, here on Patreon. And it's become like a collage tape deluxe as far as sound. You go through there for samples and stuff like that. It's just crazy. I think it's like an hour and 20 minutes long. Uh, it's inspired me to try and learn how to make small films that uh, cursed video style Myself, I've only been able to see snippets um, by live footage to know more about its creation. It seems it's just a matter of taking a video machine and keep on adding to it over the years and years and years until you got an hour long of just little snippets of, of just the craziest little things. Dwayne used to take multiple um, VCRs and, and put that together out of that. Um, this part isn't a question, but the last piece of music that smashed me, it feels, was watching one of those live last rites videos on youtube i think it's miami exactly under six minutes there's a brat turns into a piece really depressive i mean a lot of the show we would turn into a live improv that's what made each show fun for us is that you know obviously 
we felt it. We got to a point where at least a couple of times during the show, we wanted to do something live, completely made up on the spot. And uh, a large part of them, some of them were really cool. And some of them, I mean, they were all different. So thank you for that, though. Uh, Man, I love Last Rides. That tour is uh, probably the most, uh, the one skinny puppy tour where the stage show generally creeps me out. Were aspects of the Ogre's performance disturbing for the rest of the band as well? It was more like, yep, seems like the usual. Well, you know, by this time, I think we we're, you know, kind of accustomed to, to, to what could potentially happen. And, uh, you know, that's, that was nothing new really for us on this one. No, it was, you know, we had big setups in front of us. It was a lot of work. So we basically were paying attention to a lot of what we were doing. We should have more time to prepare our questions. Oh my God, you guys, this is going ages. Love at First Listen. It's one of the most twisted synth bending albums. And I, I love and used to listen on loop. I'm curious about the production of the album. Last Rites is, uh, blah, 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 blah. I got to get to the questions here, guys. This was a, my God. Nick, I, I apologize. There's so many questions here today that my eyes are starting to do tricks on me. I think I have to take like a second break here. Less Chance was such a fun trip. Was that a violin sample being used or did Dwayne play that one of his synths? I don't know, Less Chance was one of my tracks and it was a sample that I sampled from the Warhol soundtrack. So Human 8 blew my mind when I first heard it. Easily could have been an album track. Yes, was an SY77 used for one of the synth sounds at the beginning of the track, all over it. How about the other synths used for the song? Oh, as I said, you know, that song is Emacs, S900, and there is Pro One on that one as well. And TR-808. Was this a challenging album to work on? <laughs> yes. Yep. You probably answered it all. I, I think up to this point, I, I think I uh, answered a lot of these questions. Hope you don't mind me skipping through that very long question there. Oh, uh, I would wholeheartedly love to hear you do more acoustic drumming on future albums. Uh, thank you. The artwork for this album is my personal favorite. Yeah, I really love Jim's stuff too. Brett, I've been waiting for this one. I always felt like this album was closely tied to rabies for more than just River's End. Was there any crossover on how they were written? Um, not at all. Left Hand Shake was definitely been mentioned by now, but I'll throw in my vote for getting last rights together for the way you intend it. Thank you. Yeah, go and listen online. Gurno, hey, buddy. What a special album for me. It separates what SP music was before and what SP music was after Last Rites. I listened to it when I was a child and I experienced it like a child. I listening to it right now brings me right back there. I did not think about the fact that actual humans made this. I did not think about how something like this is made without pure experience. It, it doesn't stop to amaze me that I am now communicating with you. Well, Karen, I'll thank you so much. I appreciate your uh, your guys. Uh, it looks like we're finally approaching the last of the questions here, I hope. No, I shouldn't say I hope. I mean, you guys, I love your questions. I saw this tour in Boston. I got my first album in 13 when I was first saw my first SP show. I was 17 and went alone. I stood off to the side and just watched Change My World. Thank you. Uh, okay, from what I've read, at one point, you and Duane would write, record the music during the day, and Ogre would go in the studio at night. Yes, correct. Given the nature of the things, did you, and it, did you have any input into Ogre's lyrics? Absolutely nothing. Or did he have input on the instrumentals? Um, he did play guitar on Last Rites, and uh, I believe he plays it um, on Scrapyard or Nowhere. But again, um, this would be something that... Uh, him and Rave shared at night. Oscar, I'd like to know some of the non-musical context around this album. Like, what went, what, what were you guys going through while making it? What drugs were involved? Now, how were the relationships? Well, luckily at this time, um, I, I was only using weed and um, though Dwayne was utilizing acid, um, I think Dwayne was you know, definitely experimenting more. Uh, he, he just most certainly was. Definitely Ogre was, you know, in a world where um, I think he's expressed uh, many times uh, a world that was difficult to be in. And um, I think that the combination of 
you know, one guy on psychedelics and one guy on um, hard chemicals and one guy on green guy uh, means like, 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 like three, you know, three separate worlds kind of thing. I think like, you know, it's, it's like the perfect blend of, of these things, I think, in, in reality. Um, as I said earlier, when I started getting, I wouldn't get into heavy drugs until after last rites. And mistakenly, as a result of where the scene was headed in Vancouver. And I found that to be really disappointing. And um, when I finally got into heavy drugs, uh, you know, it's only smoking heavy drugs, smoking like, as they say, chasing the dragon and stuff. Um, I found that my only cure to get back was to get back to just smoking pot. And so I got back to smoking weed. And since then, I've never looked back. I would never do it. You couldn't pay me to do a line, a t like a, a hit of any drug other than weed at this point in my life. I just, you know, I'm not comfortable with acid trips or anything, I'm not comfortable with mushrooms or anything. I think that once you've opened the door, like to like your most intense acid trip or your most intense mushroom trip, the next time you go there, uh, it's just not the same. And basically, you take the risk of going back to that bad place. And that was always my my reason. Seems seemingly there's been a couple more questions. I'd like to know uh, some of the Okay, we asked that question stubborn uh, capital put out a sticker at the promo which which declared their last release. Do you know what the deal was with that marketing? I think that's got something to do with the fact that it was called Last Rites. And, you know, um, you know, at this point, we were always imploding. You know, by all means, we, uh, as a band, never never expected to make another album. And I think that we were quite surprised when, you know, we would. So, uh, Melanie, Too Dark Park was the first SP album I ever heard, but Scrapyard was the first SP song I ever heard. And it made such an impression that I still recall every detail. I was 12 years old, sitting on the floor of my bedroom and listening to the local college radio Sunday night show. And I knew somehow that song had changed me fundamentally. The next year held a lot of upheaval in my young life. And Last Rites kind of became my touchstone during that time. It got me from the ages of 13 and 14 with a little less trauma than I would otherwise have had. I felt... It felt full circle for me when you all played songs uh, from the album in St. Petersburg. I don't want to be greedy, but the but any chance we'll get to hear more of those from Last Rites in Chicago. Man, I sure wish, and I'll do my best. Uh, I don't know if you're meaning St. Petersburg as far as like on this tour or on the original Last Rites tour, but I do remember uh, Last Rites St. Petersburg show as being one of the bloodiest. Lee. Uh, hi, Kevin. Thanks, as always, uh, for these chats. I'm sure you've already covered it in the Song by Song Breakdown. Curious as to what those musical influences were which spawned nowhere. Throbbing Gristle, Early Swans. Um, for me, it was the explosions. So, in other words, the... the I mean, I just wanted to drum along with that. And then as soon as I started drumming along with that, then Dwayne started filling in with those SY-77 swells. And then as it built in, like, I mean, I couldn't believe it. That song was pretty much recorded as a live improv. So, you know, I've, it, it kind of blew my mind. And if you were behind such a song, then there was a feeling that I had about it that was when it was going down, like, I can't believe that, you know, that it's coming down the way that it is. And sometimes I'll think like, God, did the tape capture that? And then you go and listen to it, and it did. And you'll be like, okay, I heard what I what I thought I heard. <clears throat> Gregory, what was the original, was the original ending in Last Rites intended to be Circus Dance? Uh, no. Left Hand Shake download, it was meant to be download. Uh, left Hand Shake was meant to be before download. And as you, if you go listen, you will see that that is the most logical under. Okay, what about this unreleased, untitled demo supposedly called 
window pane. Yeah, I think somebody just asked about that earlier. As I said, I'm going to make a reference to this, but I'm telling you right now that that is not Skinny Puppy. It's somebody that just did a really good job at sounding like Skinny Puppy. And I will go listen to it right now. If I'm wrong, I will eat a monkey's foot. Really? Uh, no, actually, I won't. <laughs> Jared Jones. Hey, Kev, I really don't have any particular questions. We just wanted to say thanks for the music and these Sunday live chats. Well, thank you. So, Last Rites is probably my favorite puppy album, Forced to Choose. It's one of been revisiting a lot over the last six months. I've still got my old copy. I said I wanted to tell you how much I love it. I think it's easily one of the most powerful and emotionally raw albums I've ever heard. I've been playing it repeatedly. I'm sure you're going to cover everything, but I would love to hear about the sound design behind Nowhere. It's funny, huh? That track really gets under my skin. I can't get enough of it. One of the favorite things about it is the density and noise. You know, as I said, how do you? How would you like it if you were, if, if, like I composed some things of noise with the explosions and I was playing along with it, but Dwayne was doing the musical progression that that develops as the song happens. And that is the thing that blew me away is that musical progression is something that it comes from the world of Dwayne. And so huge appreciation for that song to me too, of how hidden it all is amongst the cacophony of noise. Uh, Rodney, any chance of there being concert footage for you to release from this truth? I mean, who knows? I've, you know, there is footage and it's rough footage. Uh, there's nothing with a great live recording. Unfortunately, you know, it's all, um, it's all really, really poorly recorded. And um, we'll see what happens. I mean, I've told you guys that I do have a box of live recordings from Last Rites. What I could potentially try to do is take, say some quality recordings off that and match it up with, you know, some of the visuals that there is, but I just haven't had the energy. I think the disconnect uh, on the band made me feel like not doing anything. And lately it's been really, really nice to, on the last tour, have um, a more of a connect feeling uh, with Ogre again. Uh, to say that that is, um, has been special, um, it is. And I think that everybody on the tour was, was really happy to see that happen. Um, if you were in uh, Seattle and saw Ogre and me hug at the end, that was real. So if you want to see more stuff like that, I don't know if that can say that that will happen again, but um, the tour is uh, coming up. I'm kind of looking forward to uh, getting out there and um, playing to some of these cities, which I consider to be probably um, our most hardcore fans, our most dedicated hardcore fans are in most of these cities. And it's going to be a special time, especially playing Vancouver and now our hometown in Los Angeles or San Fran or Chicago. It's going to be, you know, a huge, a huge thing for us to experience together with you guys. I mean, I used to get like goosebumps when we play Love and Vain. And to be quite honest, I, I really wish that, um, you know, we could get this back in here. I think it was... Uh, thrilling to be able to play that song. Um, uh, a lot of my uh, friends have been noting to me and I eventually ended up catching it was the, uh, oops, oh, this picture got so small. Oh, it's gone. Anthony Kilbot's uh, The Search for Last Rites. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that, but it's really funny that uh, the kid is like searching for last rites and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. And then there's a thing about our show, our last tour. So uh, Anthony Kilbot, uh, thank you for your support on Last Rites and your, show, your support on the live show. Um, yeah, I, I can't thank you guys enough for all the stuff that you do. Um, you know that it's a mind boggle um, for us in the band to you know, have shows that sell out as quickly as they've been selling out and have like the ability to play and to be like oh we're gonna add another another show for uh chicago and uh, you know it's, it just seems almost uh too good to be true so um yeah i'd just like to thank you guys for your support out there 
I, I know we're rounding up right now at three hours on this chat. So I would like to thank every one of you guys for um, kindly uh, tuning in. Uh, Jessica Kruer, you've been a major supporter of ours. Data Bomb for being my number one tech. Cora Marshall, probably no relation to Ken there. Uh, Melanie, Ophelia, Dell, Greg Nelson, any relation to Glenn Nelson? I don't know. Um, you know, you guys, I, I really respect you for tuning in and supporting this. Uh, Leticia, uh, long time going back. Hey, Rihanna's even con commented on this. Me? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for uh, Scully. I think you're out there too. Scott, Scott, I see, hey, Gary Blair Smith, one of my oldest and uh, greatest friends, Gary, big hugs to you. You know, Gary was there when this whole thing was going down. And Gary was also the guy showing all those menacing films on Two Dark Park. See, he knows what it was like to go through all this stuff. Gary, big up to you. Um, all you guys on the side window here. God, Arvin Clay, a lot of things, a lot of statements. Um, as I said, because it's been three hours long, I haven't had a chance to pay uh, attention to too many of the the other the other comments going down. But uh, big up from Tiger Lily. Oh, Tiger, that's so cute. She had her dinner, so she's really. Oh, she she had her dinner already. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's five o'clock. Well, as I said, um, I think I've covered all the bases here today on the last rights topic. I would like to say a big love to everybody. And thank you to uh, everybody in the uh, making of this album, anybody that had involvement in the making of this that we've gone through. And uh, for the future, uh, the people that will come see the shows and support that. I thank you all very much. Um, thank, thank you to all the patrons for your support. I've said it enough times, but here I go. I'm about to go eat something. All right, you ready to eat? Okay.